Views expressed by Casters Guild members are only the opinions of that member, and that could change from day to day. Guild members may use mature language, but that in no way means they are mature. Listener discretion is advised. The strike is finally over, so we're back to talk about all the stuff we couldn't all season, because that's the spell we're casting tonight on Casters Guild. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Caster's Guild. I am your Guildmaster Rick Perry, and I'm in Lesbians with you. And I am your Guildmaster Baron Kane. And a nature tip, if you ever wanted to get a bear out of hibernation, end the writers and actors strike. And joining us are two returning guild members. Feel free to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Caitlin, returning guild member and resident film detective. And I'm Bryant, also returning guild member and resident detective. Sorry, I didn't know we were doing real fancy intros i didn't set anything up yeah we i have just nothing start, witty we just started doing that a couple weeks ago <laughs> all right so Guildmaster master bear and i have had to hold back pretty much the entire season because wga and sag aftra have been striking and we haven't talked about many shows and movies almost none at all just out of solidarity and because we didn't really want to research which ones were coming from struck companies and which ones weren't so we just played it safe and didn't talk about any of them but the strike is over, so we can finally talk about some of the stuff that went on. So rather than just seize everything myself, I'm going to give an opportunity to our returning guild members. Is there anything that was part of Struck content that you guys really want to talk about right now? No, I checked out the, the list of things that you had, of, of topics that you wanted to talk about. I have nothing, nothing outside of that, really. From that? Inter- I saw you had five guys. Uh, I was about to say five guys. I was thinking of the burger place. Five <laughs> Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. That definitely came out during Struck content. And I know there were a lot of people, including Matthew Lillard himself, who were really excited to talk about that and kind of was holding back until the strike was over. Yeah, it seems like everybody has um, something different to say about the movie, along with their opinion and where they kind of see video games, video game movies going from here. Me personally, I'm going to be honest, I have not seen the movie. I don't have a Paramount. I believe it's Paramount that is on Paramount or Peacock, one of them. But I don't have a Paramount subscription. So I have not had a chance to see it. And I haven't really made it a priority because I never played any of the games either. But I know it's a bit of a big deal and a lot of people have a lot of opinions about it. I've never played the games. I always heard of them. I know that I don't know. I always got confused of like who the demographic was for it because remember my ex, like her kids were in a Five Nights at Freddy, but they were like eight years old. And then my brother talked about it while growing up, you know, he was a teenager like five years ago. But ever, always I saw the gameplay. I never it never interested me, but I knew of the hype, so I still went ahead and, and watched the movie. I don't think it was horrible. I don't think it was good, but I wouldn't say like I felt like I wasted my time watching it. And if they can improve some things in the sequels, I'm down to watch it. I'm, I'm down to continue forward because it looks like it's going to be a trilogy. At the very least. I think. Oh, yeah. You how much money it made. Yeah. I think just like the video games, the video games were originally just supposed to be a trilogy. That was Scott Cawthon's original vision. And it just went somewhere that he wasn't expecting it to go. All the theorists jumped on it. And he was like, well, as long as these things keep spitting out money i guess i'm gonna keep making them which is one of the reasons the lore has changed so many times over the years because he was like well originally i had this story that i was going to tell in these three video games and now i have to kind of stretch it and change it so there's been a lot of rewrites over the years so i think we'll see something the same with the movies i think we can pretty much guarantee three movies and then if they continue to become some of the highest grossing movies then they'll keep making them yeah i feel like though like i don't know how you can continue making movies until it gets old especially since there is also uh willie's wonderland which really bad nick cage movie that was the same exact premise but i feel like because of that i was like all right i don't really need to see a five night at freddy's movie i loved willie's wonderland um i did too (laughs) Which it's was, bad, but it's so fun. It was capitalizing on the FNAF popularity. Yeah. 
Uh, they mm-hmm. just kind of beat them to the punch as far as making a movie goes. Yeah, I feel like that's the thing, too, is it felt like it was a late movie. It felt like it kind of came out late for the Five Nights at Freddy hype, um, at least as far as I'm aware of. But The fans are diehard fans. Like, those who are really into it are still into it to this day. Okay. Um, I know at least three people who wore FNAF costumes for Halloween. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know it was still, like, in, I guess. <laughs> oh, see how much money it made. Yeah, I... And I mean, the fandom was so large that even people like me became interested in the film and what this was about, not even playing it. So I think the secondhand effect worked really well. Okay. I think a lot of people got drug into it for the movie as well, because you have your Matthew Lillard horror fans who were like, oh, yeah. Matthew Lillard was in Scream, and now he's in this other horror movie, let's go. And then a bunch of people who got drug by their, who are horror movie fans who got drug by their FAF, FNAF fan friends. And they were like, you like horror movies. Come on, let's go watch this movie. I was actually there for PETA from Hunger Games. <laughs> like, I wonder if he'll paint himself as a cake again and hide from the animatronics. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I, I didn't really see it. I don't have a ton to say about it. I just know we had to bring it up because it's it's a fandom you can't ignore. Yeah. I would, I would at least say if you're interested in watch it, watch it. I know it has a... 30 something 36 percent on rotten tomatoes which kind of throws some people off but that means that 36 percent of the people did like the film so you have a three out of ten chance of being one of those people and like i said i i don't think it was a good movie but i didn't feel like i wasted my time when it was over i would say that as someone who's not necessarily familiar with the i mean i'm familiar with the franchise but i've like never sat down hardcore played the games and who doesn't like horror movies i actually enjoyed this movie that actually says a lot coming from you. I don't know if it says a bad thing or a good thing, though. You know, same. I, I couldn't decipher whether or not it, it's what it's saying is good or bad, but it definitely says a lot. <laughs> it says something. Yeah. It definitely says something. I don't think this actually works as a, as a horror film. I think if you're a person who likes horror films, if you're a horror fan and you go to watch this, this isn't going to do anything for you. This has some of the worst, like the most oddly timed jump scares I've seen in a movie. Yeah, as far as jump scares go, it didn't really... I mean, for a game that is known for jump scares, it doesn't really take it home, does it? No, like, they would do kind of that that loud sound as somebody opens up a door, but it was just... It was like a millisecond off to take out the complete effect. Mm-hmm. Might be something yeah. to make it the timing better for the sequel. Uh, it could be because it was a... It was also a PG-13 film, which I didn't realize till like, the day before I watched it. Though there there is a part in there that... I felt like I was like, whoa, we we can do that now in PG-13 <laughs> films. There's like a real like like there's a some body mutilation. And I was really surprised. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as long as they uh, don't show the blood, which from what I understand, there wasn't a whole lot of blood in like the scenes where you would expect it. And as long as they don't show the blood. Yeah, they're they're OK with it in the PG-13. How about you, Caitlin? Anything on the list of things to talk about or anything else that came out during the strike that you really want to talk about well i think the big thing this year in film in general was of course barbenheimer and that happened right at the strike so i don't think you've had a chance to really talk about that and, and that impact we definitely have not at all yeah that was actually what when i saw my five nights afraid i was like wait i should have brought up barbenheimer like that's like the film event of the year <laughs> yeah but not just barbenheimer just that around barbenheimer just that we just had a real congested blockbuster season that i think was something that can be is going to be studied by film analysts uh here soon for the for the next couple summer blockbusters because there was just i think like for the first time i've ever seen uh, that i can remember there was just too much out there and the only one that really succeeded because there was so much is barbenheimer they released these two big movies and both of them did extremely well and they both oh go ahead caitlin yeah, and I keep seeing people trying to, like, recreate that hype. Like, oh, this movie and this movie are coming out. It's going to be the next Barbenheimer. But the reason why Barbenheimer did so well is because their marketing was always tied together. Because even when they were first having casting announcements, it was every single day you were getting a new casting announcement, either from Barbie or Oppenheimer. And it was, like, the whole Hollywood, like, actors were all in those two films. So, like, it got a lot of hype from its marketing in the beginning before anything. So you can't, like, really recreate that. I think another thing that kind of helped it, too, was um, when 
people from Barbie, like people who were involved with the movie, would go to Oppenheimer Mm -hmm. and post pictures of themselves with the ticket and then vice versa. Yeah. So they were like promoting each other's movie at the same time. It's like, what the hell? It's like, you guys have gotten so big. No one even knows that Mission Impossible came out. Yeah. And the Barbie marketing. Yeah. The Barbie marketing itself was amazing and I think should definitely be studied because they went above and beyond. And Oppenheimer, you can't really market Oppenheimer. So I think that it definitely benefited from that, um, from the Barbie marketing. But it obviously, of course, did well on its own and from word of mouth. And I think it's it's definitely the highest grossing biopic now, which I'm I'm happy for it. But I think it also beat some other records as well. Yeah, and I love the conversation that like, for one whole day, it was like, which one are you going to go see? Are you going to go see Barbie mm-hmm. or Oppenheimer? And then the very next day, the entire conversation shifted and was like, no, you're going to go see them both. Which one are you going right. to see first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I did. I did the Barbenheimer and it was late. I saw Barbie, I think at like seven. And then I saw Oppenheimer. I went to another theater because I went to the one was a re- regular. And then I went to the IMAX and it was... I think it was like 10 o'clock that I saw that one. So yeah, from, from 7 till like 2 in the morning, I had experienced Barbenheimer. I'll be honest, I'm kind of failing on all uh, sides here because I have not seen Oppenheimer. Uh, and, and I didn't see Barbie until like two days ago. Wow, okay. Well, you were doing it because of the solidarity, so. Yeah. Get yeah, it. yeah. It. <laughs> solidarity. <laughs> yeah, I saw Barbie first. I crocheted. I crocheted a bit. I crocheted my own costume for it, and I wore a Greta Gerwig shirt. I, I'm i a big Greta Gerwig fan, and while I have my issues with Barbie, I, I really did enjoy it. And I enjoyed Oppenheimer, too. And for me, I'm kind of, I'm not a Christopher Nolan hater. But I wasn't pleased with him after his last couple of films. So I wasn't sure what to expect going into Oppenheimer, but I did like it. And I think he is a good director. It's just I think sometimes he needs to tune himself down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I did not like T- Tenet, I think, was his was his peak Nolan. I was like, all right, man, you got to yeah. gotta bring it back. And I think he did bring it back a little bit for for Oppenheimer. Uh, which also you mentioned records for Oppenheimer. One of the most interesting records I thought for it is that it never reached number one in the box office, but it has become the highest grossing movie to never be in the number one of the box office because of Barbie. Okay. And Barbie, I think of course is the highest grossing female directed film as far as I know. Oh, oh yeah. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Maybe though. I liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. So it's not even like one of those, you know, just, marketing and promotion it was actually just a good movie too so yeah yeah i think it it had a lot to say and it said it without being preachy or beating you over the head with it like it didn't feel like i was being talked at while watching the movie which was really good i know a a lot of people over on the right got really upset about it oh Uh, yeah (laughs) (laughs) but i think that just helped promote the movie honestly i think the they had the opposite effect of what they wanted yeah, which I don't understand because it's very like intro to Tumblr feminism mm-hmm. and it probably was a little bit more lenient on Ken than what I thought it should have been, but it's just a fun movie. It's just altogether yeah. a fun movie and the production of it is just such a joy to look at. Also, I think the right came in a little too late, or at least not not just the right, but those that were opposing the film. Like I felt like I started hearing things just a couple weeks before it came out. I'm like the 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 snowball is too big at this point. Like you're just all you're doing is spreading the awareness. And I thought it was funny when the movie finally came out that it was a bit of a contradiction to the the rights ideals in which like you know they a lot of times when you see people saying like oh why can't we make jokes about people anymore why do people get offended about certain things so much but then here you have a movie making fun of somebody it's, it's kind of it's making fun of men it's not it's not talking down to them it's not insulting them but it is making fun of the patriarchy but now you're getting upset because they're making fun of something so it's all fun and games you can make fun of whatever you 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 want to make fun of whatever you like but when the joke turns around to you that's when it's now offensive right yeah you can make fun of whatever you want and anybody who gets upset is just too sensitive until you make fun of christianity and men and then you know that's that's too much don't do that (laughs) or 
or you know, or when they make fun of how dry you like things. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Somebody, that's true. somebody should just Thank revoke you. that man's microphone privileges. Oh my god! Oh my god! He's oh, we started taking people. To watch it. Really? Mm-hmm. If we start taking away microphones, we, th- there's nowhere to store all those microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Too many people saying things too quickly. <laughs> All right, Baron, what's your one you can't wait to talk about? Oh, God, my one. We're, we'll go it. Look, we're, we're going to talk movies? about them all. But right, yeah. right. Are, are, are we talking movies and shows? Just yeah, movies? Just movies or show. Just pick one and let's dive into Loki that one next. Two. Loki season two. Holy shit. That was a great show. It, it, it is like one of those shows that was so good that it when it did have its flaws, it was so easy to just be like, oh, suspension of disbelief. I don't believe that happened. And then just keep on going with it. <laughs> oh, it was so good. And even even then, it's like the entire end of, like the last episode made everything just a hundred times better. It was so fucking good. I, like the last maybe 15 minutes of that show, I was just open mouth, just staring, trying not to cry watching this thing wow it was so good i was there I for the a lot ride. about the i was there for the ride like starting from the first episode every episode i thought i had this show figured out i'm like oh this is what kind of show it's gonna be and then the next episode would hit and i'd be like oh i was wrong it's now this type of show but i was never disappointed at being wrong like every time they took a different turn or took a different twist or were going down a different road i was there for it and like Baron said, I the finale took actually took a little while to hit me because I had an idea of what was happening. And then like two days later, I was thinking back on the finale and then realizing what kind of impact it could actually have on the future of the MCU. And I was like, oh, OK, this is much bigger than I thought it was. And it's funny, too, because I had that reaction to the, the last episode like the one I described. And then I had that thought, like how this is going to affect things. So it just, it just blew me away all over again. So yeah, I don't know if, did you guys see it? No. So I watched season one, but I haven't gotten around to seeing season two yet, but I was wondering how Ki Kui Kwan was in it because I was excited when he was getting in it. I mean, do you want me to tell you how he was in it or without spoilers? Okay. Yeah. Well, let, like, okay. does he have like a big role? Well, oh, yes. Let, okay. let me let me just say we will try to avoid spoiling this one because you guys haven't seen it. But we will be spoiling other things for the rest of this episode, especially when we get to mine, because there's no way I'm going to be able to hold back. So <laughs> yeah, go go ahead. But yeah, no, he. I think in my opinion, he plays one. He's in there quite a bit. Two, he plays a pivotal role in. Okay. A couple different ways, I, which I can't really describe, or it's going to be a spoiler. So, do you think that he'll have a bigger role in the MCU moving forward? Can you say no. that? No. Okay. I don't All think right. he will. Gotcha. I still haven't watched it. It's been one of the. It was the only thing that I've been looking forward to from Marvel for for a while until the, the Echo trailer came out, and I when it first when Loki first premiered and the early reviews were coming out, they were mixed. I was like, dang, I thought it was, you know, Marvel had been failing, you know, not just for me, but for, for a lot of people. I, yeah. you know, I fell off the Marvel bandwagon a couple years ago, but I know like recently, you know, they just haven't been hitting the mark. So I just held back. But hearing, you know, hearing you guys talk about it, hearing everybody talk about it and how good that finale was. And, you know, I also saw something about, you know, Loki's arc coming to an end, which I wasn't, was never a huge Loki fan, but I did really like that first season, which I wasn't even anticipating that much i just somebody put it on and i watched it and i think we finished it in a day or two uh so it's it's the next show that i'm going to watch once i'm finished the current one i'm on just to manage expectations a little bit i am one of those people who never fell off the mcu just because i'm here for it whether no matter how good or bad it gets like i'm here for the comic book hokiness of it people didn't like multiverse of madness people didn't like she hulk And I loved both of those. So just understand when I say I really liked Loki, I'm also a person who really liked She-Hulk and Multiverse of Madness. So just manage that expectation there. 
Well, I will say this too that I mean, again, I agree. I am here for Marvel. I will watch everything they put out, and it is walking into it like no expectations because I've learned to curb my expectations on shit. And I am more than willing to tell you what I don't like and what doesn't work for me, how they did something wrong, in my opinion. Don't like Multiverse of Madness. That was fun, but they didn't do enough with it on all sides. They should have did more cameos. They should have did more. Mm-hmm. They yeah. should let Sam Raimi run with it a little harder. Bruce Campbell's cameo should have been a little bigger. It, you know, just stuff like that. Stuff probably like should that. probably should have seen a few more multi, uh, two more layers of the multiverse, like a few more universes. Yeah, I mean something, anything. I just, I'm a Scarlet Witch fan. She's my favorite comic and that, character. And there that. is that. And it's just terrible casting whitewashed uh and decisions that they made in wandavision that i thought were offensive i think i just kind of fell off marvel partly because of that uh well i will say this that the way they did scarlet witch in the multiverse of madness after she had a redemption arc in wandavision which her falling the way she did I, I, I guess we can rationalize it that she kind of did that in the comics anyway, so they're going based off of the comics. But for her to fall, come back up, just to fall harder, that didn't make sense to me. Yeah, and I feel like with the MCU's depiction of her, it's a little bit more girl bossy, um, or at least that's how like the fandom reaction has been from what I've seen. And the thing with Wanda in the comics is that There has been retcons and kind of going back to House of M and looking and seeing maybe we shouldn't villainize mental health and maybe we kind of add a little bit more nuance to that and show our growth that way. And so I think that's something that I think was really important to me in the comics. And I think it's just a very, very different character that they're showing in the MCU. Oh, 100 percent. I think I think she was okay earlier. Like they showed her kind of like as the villain in the beginning, which she was. Um, and then like getting into, you know, the Infinity War and stuff like that. I thought they I thought they did a really good job of making her a girl boss without making her girl bossy. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It's like they didn't seem like they were attempting to pander instead of looking to honor and respect and actually show real strength. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I get the feeling well, like like, for example, the girl boss scene in in game yeah oh yeah it's like you could have devoted maybe a half hour showing each of those women being a fucking badass but you want them all to drop in at the same time pose for a picture and then fly away it's like that's come on man yeah come on devote the time and respect that these characters deserve these women deserve and don't do that shit. That I, I they didn't do that to anybody else, just the women. I don't know. Just me. Agreed. All right. It's uh it's my turn now. And I've been waiting since the beginning of this strike. I was I wasn't done with Loki too. Uh too bad. <laughs> um <laughs> I'm 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 bouncing da- bouncing up and down oh, over here. No, like no, seriously, no. like <laughs> I have I feel like I know what it is. I have wanted to talk we about this. We all know what it is. <laughs> I've wanted to talk about this since it was announced. Um, but I've been restraining myself and episode after episode, new announcement would come, new trailers would come and I've wanted to talk about it and I couldn't, but Scott Pilgrim got an anime on Netflix and it was fucking amazing spoilers from here on out, because I think it's as early as the end of episode one, it goes an entirely different direction than the graphic novels and the movie to the point where it could almost be an entirely different property. So, okay, so I'm assuming, Caitlin, you have not seen it. Has anybody else here seen it? I have not seen it. First two episodes. First two episodes, episodes. okay. So, so <laughs> Baron, I don't care about spoilers, you're good. <laughs> Baron, you know the major twist here. So, like, in episode one, Scott Pilgrim loses to Matthew Patel, which, if you've seen the movies or the graphic novels, you know what that means for the series. I mean, like, And then we go through an entire almost detective story over the next seven episodes where Ramona Flowers is convinced that he didn't lose to Matthew Patel, that somebody created a portal and pulled him away and kidnapped Scott 
away from the fight. And we go through Ramona Flowers trying to find Scott. Can I can I ask a question since we're spoiling it anyways? Absolutely. Does Crash and the Boys have anything to do with it? No. Oh, which, what? Which is really disappointing because like they just straight up cut Crash and the Boys from yeah. the anime. And Crash and the oh. Boys are some of my, my favorite characters from the graphic novel. And I feel like they already got truncated in the movie. And I was really oh, hoping yeah. now that we had eight episodes, we were going to get to see more from Crash and the Boys. And nothing. Not not yeah. even not exactly. even like we didn't even see them the entire series but the entire series gives off the vibe that between creating the graphic novels and the creation of this anime brian leo malley went to therapy and (laughs) learned a lot about himself and has taken it all and applied it to the the anime series because anybody so he was he did have a major part in writing of the anime series then Yes, uh, actually, both okay. him and Ag- Edgar Wright, because okay. they'll cool. both they'll both tell you that like toward the end of the graphic novel series and the creation of the movie, they were working so closely and hand in hand that mm. neither of them know who came up with the end of the movie and who came up with the end of the graphic novel series because they're both very different. But they were bouncing ideas off of each other so much that they don't even remember who wrote what. So, I think. Brian Lee O'Malley was just like, yeah, if we're going to do this series, we need Edgar Wright, too, because I'm not sure what of it I wrote and how much he's responsible for. Gotcha. I will say that I'm going to have to agree with our uh, guild member, Billy, who isn't here tonight. But um, one thing that bothered me was that Beck's not involved. Not necessarily that Beck was not involved, but those songs from the movie aren't involved. <laughs> yes, Beck's like- songs from the movie are not involved, but a couple songs from the movie are. Okay. Is it Black Sheep? You do get Black Sheep, yeah. I, is, you know how I know that? It's because she's been popping up. Metric's been popping up a lot yeah. on social media lately. So, yeah. Yeah, Black Sheep gets put in there. And, of course, the, the, the track that inspired the graphic novel, Scott Pilgrim, yeah. is on there as well by Plum Tree. Nice. But other than that, it's pretty much an entirely new soundtrack. And it slaps. It's, no, it's, no, it's good. It's bangers it's from good. beginning to end. It's a mash. But, I mean, anybody who is a Scott Pilgrim fan and isn't a toxic human being will yeah. tell you <laughs> will tell you that the graphic novel and the movie, like, Scott is not a good guy. Yeah. Ramona is not a good person. And most of the people they involve themselves with, especially the Seven Evil Exes, are all really toxic people. And the entire graphic novel series in the movie are about two toxic people who get in a relationship that's so toxic that it literally kills the people around them. And the anime series addresses that hardcore. Just smacks you right in the face with it and goes, this is what needs to change. Like, these are the two people. These are their flaws. These are the lessons they need to learn. And it catharsis is the word for it honestly, because it leaves all the stuff about Scott Pilgrim that I love, the the video game, the love letter to video games, the love letter to pop culture. They even, in the middle of the series, they go to record the movie Scott Pilgrim with director Edgar Wrong. <laughs> and multiple evil exes get cast as Scott Pilgrim. It, it's fantastic. Just if you're a Scott Pilgrim fan, please watch this series. Um, if you're not a Scott Pilgrim fan, go watch the movie at least. I mean, I want you to read the graphic novels, but that's quite a commitment. Go watch the movie at least so you know what's being addressed in the anime. And then go watch the anime because it's great. The animation's great. The soundtrack's great. The subject matter is fucking fantastic. I could gush about this movie, for the, this movie, this series for the next two hours. Um, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping now that this is out, he'll go back to writing Snot Girl, because that's my experience of Brian O'Malley, and I love it, but it's been on hiatus for way too long. Um, just just to add to uh, what you just said, I would say that if you watch the movie and didn't like it for very good reasons, based off of what Rick is saying, go back and watch the cartoon, because it sounds like they make up for it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I got that Scott was not a good person. That's clear in the movie. I didn't know about Ramona as well. And I only read like the first chapter or something of the graphic novel. 
and I played the video game, so that's my experience with Scott Pilgrim. But that's interesting to hear, like, they're both toxic and flawed characters. That actually makes me want to watch it even more, even though I'm, like, already, I don't know why I've put it off. I feel like with some modern audiences, you do have to spell things out a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. With the the movie, they hint at it like Ramona literally has the quote, I've dabbled in being a bitch. But if you actually go back and look at the backstory at each of her exes, she never was dumped. She always used people and then threw them away. And that's what created her seven, seven evil exes. So she didn't dabble in being a bitch. She was a mega bitch. Until finally she was manipulated, which was not the way to solve her being. But look, nobody was good. Like even the people who overcame Ramona did so by being toxic. So, yeah, it, but they address all of that in the anime. They leave no stone unturned in people's toxicity. Um, I will say maybe they don't show how toxic a lot of the evil exes are, but I feel like that was explored enough in the movies yeah. and and the the graphic novels so it was They're more about yeah <laughs> it was more about showing the flaws of the two main characters not to say that they don't explore it at all especially lucas lee lucas lee gets actually a redemption arc here in the uh the anime so yeah i would just say that i don't i don't think it's modern audience need it spelled out i think it's just audience in general just throughout <laughs> Just movie and TV history, there have been a lot of characters that people look at, and it's like you're not yeah. supposed to, you're not you're not supposed to idolize that person. I know, like right now, one of the big ones is Rick from Rick and Morty, but you also mm-hmm. got characters like Tony Montana from Scarface, who definitely shouldn't be idolized. Tyler Durden from Fight Club. Now, also, I want to point out too, this is a lot of stuff that we talked about on your guys's podcast just recently. Yeah. Yeah, which is also why I'm trying, I'm like, as I'm, uh, before I say anything, I was thinking, I was like, all right, I want to make some new examples, kind of, kind of switch it up a little bit. Well, I was like, we well, did talk about this. Joker from let the me, Dark Knight. Let me promote yep. you real quick, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's not what I was trying to do, I promise. That's what I was trying to, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, get- direct him to our podcast, Brian. <laughs> hear, hear, hear us get deeper into this conversation on their podcast. <laughs> hey, Rick, you want to go ahead and pass me that wheel? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I've gushed enough about... Uh, Scott Pilgrim takes off. So I've got a list here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start at the top of the list. This is no particular order. This is just the list of trailers that I found. Some of these are coming out. Some of these have come out. But I'm just going to kind of go down the list. And we're just going to give our impressions of these. So let's start with Inside Out 2. Eh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the first one. But I think they said all they needed to say. If you want to see more, go to Dimension 20 and watch Mentopolis. You'll be great. Oh, I never even thought of that, but that's that's actually fantastic. <laughs> I was not a big fan of the first one. I saw it in theaters. I saw this in theaters with Rick's mom. And I remember in like the most like intense emotional part, the kids like crying. It's it's intense. It's sad. She leans over and says, Fucking cry, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that is so my mom yeah. <laughs> yep <laughs> i was about to say i don't remember that in a movie uh, oh, okay. <laughs> no that's my mom yeah that's my childhood <laughs> right there <laughs> some, and i died <laughs> some insight this into how i was raised there you go <laughs> this is why i didn't bring rick oh my god I would love your mother forever. Anyways. <laughs> I would be more excited for this movie if the first one had um, was bolder and mm-hmm. did something that I really wanted to see, which was kind of tackling more like the complex emotions and kind of looking into also some some of like mental illness when it comes to just losing all joy. Because she just be, basically comes depressed and she has like a you know, emotional and mental issues that aren't explored in the film that I thought could be explored in a creative way and could have been still introduced in a friendly kid way, kind of like Zootopia does with racism. Uh, Inside Out could have been like that for mental illness. So it looks like they're now going to go into puberty and also some more mixed emotions. And I don't see them taking any bold steps like they uh, 
because you know they they missed the uh, they missed their chance last movie and also i think also when it comes to you know a female coming of age movies we just had what was it red panda big panda turning turning red, red. turning red which was fantastic yeah it was really good yeah and that was a good metaphor and everything so i don't know what this you know other than doing what pixar does which is probably just gonna be another sequel of somebody just trying to get back home i don't know i don't know what there is to be excited for this film so the new emotion that was introduced in the trailer was anxiety, um, mm-hmm. which means that they they could be going to address mental illness in, in this particular movie. In my opinion, what we're going to be looking at is too little too late, um, because like you said, it should have been more addressed in the first movie. And I don't know if Pixar is going to Im- implement the emotional depth required to really bring me in on this movie Mm -hmm. and i feel like with anxiety like you kind of you know you have the anxiety that i think you can really look at from the mental illness but then i think there's also just kind of like i don't know i feel like they're they're gonna play down anxiety and like just make it it more more nervousness yeah more of the like coming of age teenager angle as opposed to like an actual clinical thing right yeah more nervous and worry about their and self-conscious right i feel like also i'm just like not interested in pixar sequels Unless they're Toy Story? I mean, Unless they're Toy Story, yeah. I'm not even really interested in Toy Story sequels. I mean, God, you're oh, right. Oh, not I'm anymore. Not... Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, t- today, I, I just read anymore. something that Tim Allen apparently was quoted saying that him and Tom Hanks were contacted for Toy Story 5. I'm not sure about that. Jesus. I read that in a headline. Uh, I saw that I he mean... wanted to be about Andy getting reunited with all his toys. Like, no, <laughs> that's not how it's going to go. <laughs> Even if, it was, no sense. even if it was, don't do that. <laughs> like, even if yeah, it's what they don't. wanted to, don't, don't do that. <laughs> please don't do it. <laughs> All right, moving on. Next thing on my list was Avatar The Last Airbender, the Netflix series. Mm-hmm. Anyone okay. who listens to this podcast has probably heard me rant about the M. Night Shyamalan movie. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I did it for a good 20 minutes Awful. on the Avatar episode, and I have ranted and raved about it on other episodes as well but i think i think we're safe with this one um here's the thing netflix in general they started doing these live action animes right and they were fucking terrible okay like we started with like (laughs) around like death note i think might have been the first one oh yeah yeah and oh god it was bad but recently they have been coming out with some netflix exclusive animes like you've got zom 100 bucket list of the dead um which was really good i watched it from beginning to end in like a day and i really enjoyed it and then i while i've not watched um one piece live action i've heard a lot of really good things from fans of the anime so it seems like netflix is paying more attention to what the fans want instead of what they think is going to make them money. So if they continue that trend, we, we might get something good. I'm optimistic cautiously. If we can call that a trend, I mean, what the trend is the one piece series did well, but right before the cowboy bebop was kind of in a, an odd spot as well. Cause it seems like Netflix wants to do their own thing, but at the same time, they want to make sure that they, do what they need to do for the fans and pretty much remake the same thing. So I en- I enjoyed the Bebop live action. Maybe I, I, I don't know if I'm in the, yeah I don't know if I'm the min- minority there, but I enjoyed it. And like I'm I, also counting the fact that they were making really bad animes, and recently it looks like the the Netflix animes exclusive animes have been good as well. They have been pretty will, good. Yeah, I will say I didn't. I, I liked the uh, Cowboy Bebop remake as well. Mm-hmm. But I can still say that they missed the mark. You know? <laughs> I don't think it's a mark that they should have taken. And I don't, I don't think that there was just a way to, unless you went in a completely different direction. But if you're trying to remake a lot of the same moments and you're trying to recreate that style, it's, it's too difficult. And it's just like, all right, well, I'll just go back and watch Cowboy Bebop again. I didn't finish the series, but from what I saw from it, like I said, I don't think it was, I don't think it was terrible, like a lot of people said, but yeah, they missed the mark, and I don't think it's something they should have taken. Also, I don't think we can count this, but I want to bring it up anyway. Um, I also watched the Kenshin live action that wasn't made for Netflix, but it sure was on Netflix, and uh, I enjoyed th- I enjoyed that too. 
Which I think we referenced in another podcast as well about yeah. how that was one of the more successful ones. Mm-hmm. Which recently got remade. Actually, I've been thinking about checking out that anime because uh, I've checked out the original all the way to I forgot what it was. It was like the end of the arc where he's fighting against the burnt dude, and then someone told me that was like filler from there on out. So I just stopped watching it. But I don't even think it was filler from there on out. But yeah, I've been thinking about watching the the remake. It looks like they're kind of doing something like Hunter X Hunter did, two thousand eleven. Right. I started watching the remake and then I just got too annoyed with how he talked. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe that makes sense. Yes, it does. Do it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> Netflix is doing okay if they keep a show on long enough, but they just cancel so much. Yeah, that's true. I, I, and they cancel everything that's not Netflix. Stranger Things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I don't know. I heard they're doing wow. good with limited series. Maybe that's where they need to stick. Doing good on the what series? Uh, on limited series. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because once it's out, it's out. You, you get your full yeah, story. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I will say they also, like, I don't know if you guys watched the newest season of Black Mirror, but I feel yes, like it I doesn't, did. it, doesn't, it didn't have the impact that the previous seasons did. No, they tried to switch it up. They tried to go away from their premise, and I don't think it worked. Which is funny because the CEO came out and said that wasn't our premise. And I was like, what? That's, that's the worst yeah. cover up. Uh, now I see why sometimes people, like I see now why Sony just hasn't said anything because they looked at the CEO of Netflix like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Or the, the CEO of Flash who tried to say, oh, well, the CGI is bad because that's the way Flash sees. Like Flash sees in PlayStation <laughs> 2 graphics. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> now with Avatar, I guess I'm a little bit hesitantly excited for it. I will say all the side cast, the casting is phenomenal, mm-hmm. but it's the main cast that I have an issue with. Okay, when you I'm say just m- not a fan, when you say main cast, are you just talking about the the main three? Uh, yeah, Katara, um, Sokka, Zuko, and Aang. Aang's okay, but I know there was controversy because the actor who is played Sokka lied about his Native American heritage. And got Oof. called out with that, which wouldn't be an issue if they just casted dark skin actors in the first place. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't I haven't actually looked at the casting other than watching the trailer. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, I thought both Zuko and Iroh looked good to me. Um, Iroh but... looks really good. I'm really excited for Daniel Day Kim as the Fire Lord. Yeah, I'm really excited for the like outside of the main cast. I think mm-hmm. it's phenomenal. One thing I say every time these live action remakes come out or any kind of remake is if I seen the original si- series, what is the point of watching this? Like, what does this bring? What does this bring new? Uh, I mean, like we just talked about Scott Pilgrim. You you know, you gave me reasons to to go back and watch the, the anime series because it's doing something new. And also, you know, it's mm-hmm. an anime style. So if it's just if it's just live action and I don't know, maybe it's different because I just for the first time finished uh, Avatar like two years ago so it's very recent on my mind Mm -hmm. but i don't know i can't think off the top of my head like any live action versions of shows and things that you know or it's the same thing with video games if i play the video game what is it in the movie that's going to make me want to go out and see it no that's fair i've never thought of it that way but like as i as i go back and try to think of an example to counter your point i really can't so yeah that makes a lot of sense to me yeah, because I think that's part of why The Last of Us did so well is because they added so much while still straying to, like, still keeping true to the source material. Like, I think you definitely have properties that completely stray from the source material and it doesn't work. But as long as you keep the heart of what it is and kind of do your own thing, you can be really successful with it. And I think that worked more. I wonder if that worked more for people who didn't watch a series because, again, for me personally, I fell off The Last of Us series. But again, it was the same thing. I was like, I play this game. I play this game I didn't feel two that. and a half times. I was like, I just, I experienced this. I experienced all these emotions. I'm good. I don't, that's why I think like if they did really go out and remake these properties, just go all out, go completely away from remaking it and just make another story, another retelling, much like comic book movies do with comic books. See, yeah. that's where I think they stray too far. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, uh, sometimes the, I don't know, it, that, that one depends. Yeah, it does seem like these live action series do sometimes fail at putting a new spin on these series. Like a lot of the spins that they do put on them just either just don't work or they're not right. 
but they definitely should be doing something new. But who knows what that new thing is. But I'll tell you who can put a new spin on some of your favorite properties. TVillain.com. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. T-Villain is a t-shirt site where you'll find a killer limited edition shirt being sold for $13 only while supplies last. Every Monday, the site features a new design by a new artist. We would tell you what's featured right now, but by the time you hear this, it's already changed. They choose the most ingenious designs that reflect everything evil and villainy, as well as works pertaining to anything artistic, pulp style, lowbrow, pop culture, TV, movies, music, video games, comics, etc., all things cool and evil, basically. To check them out and help out Casters Guild, click our link in the description. All right, so coming back in here, um, I actually didn't watch this trailer until it was brought up when we were talking to you guys for your podcast. Um, the Madam Web trailer. <laughs> and I, I watched it. That It's a thing that happens. <laughs> um... It, it, I didn't realize it would be possible for me to be less excited about a movie after watching this trailer, especially with how unexcited I was in the first place. I got motion sickness from watching that trailer. <laughs> like, I legit couldn't finish it because I was getting ill. I was like, this is these camera movements. I'm not feeling well. The beginning cuts very odd. Uh, I would say like the second time I watch it, it didn't. Maybe because I was expecting it, but it didn't feel too frantic for me. But it's a very, it's, I think it's a poor, poorly edited trailer. And we we did, so actually we didn't talk about it on the podcast. We talked about it while we were, like right after our podcast, I did cut that portion out because we had been uh, done recording. Sure. Uh, but I, I was telling Caitlin, because I was trying to get Caitlin to watch it, because uh, Caitlin's a screenwriter and, you know, she, like, there's just things that you don't do in, in writing and there's just some things that stand out to writers. And actually this one just stood out to everybody this has one of the most now like infamous lines in a movie mm -hmm. or at least the trailer which is funny because and i was telling uh baron and caitlin here before we started recording i was like sony has put in two of their trailers for two of their movies in the spider-verse two of the most infamous movie lines out there that have just made people groan which is venom's a turd in the wind mm. and <laughs> now you have I know that man. He was in the Amazon with my re mother researching spiders right before she died. <laughs> and it's just like, it, yeah, I think, you know, that's, and, and like I told them, I, was, I think AI could write better than that. Or at least they're using some outdated AI to write their, their uh, dialogue. And, uh, but, and I think that um, Secret Invasion proves that wrong. Can Sony afford... Like what they, I don't even, Sony seems like they don't try so much with this that I don't even think they would bother trying with the AI. Like, <laughs> Not when like you can this get an intern like, to write it for free. Why, why, yeah. pay, why pay for an AI program when an intern could write it for free? <laughs> it, yeah. Actually, the whole Amazon thing, that seems more like um, autocomplete from Google or on your um, it does iMessage. It like it. Yep. And it's been memed to death. I think my favorite meme is one I sent Brian. It showed the lost in translation whisper, and he was saying that to it into uh, um, Scarlett Johansson's ear at the end of Lost in Translation. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. <laughs> the best one I saw was Matt Damon in Oppenheimer when he's talking about like, wait, you're telling me there's a chance that this bomb will destroy the world? But then they changed it. It was like, wait, you're telling me there's a chance that that man was in the Amazon with my mother? <laughs> <laughs> like, even, even putting all that aside, like, as someone who enjoys comic book movies, while pretty much everything Sony has tried to put out through the Spider-Verse, be it Venom, Venom 2, uh, Morbius, whatever, it's all been bad, but I could at least see what they were trying to do and failed at. I don't understand what it is they're trying to do with Madam Web. No. My my exposure to Madam Web as a fan, as I've stated on the podcast before, I love comic book stuff, but I've never been really an avid comic book reader. My exposure to Madam Web has been through the 90s cartoon show and um, Shattered Dimensions, the PlayStation game. And I I don't see where this character, this movie connects to the character as I know her at all. Yeah, so I'm familiar through the 90s cartoon. That was my first exposure. And then uh, reading the Spider-Man comics, The Amazing Spider-Man, I have actually started at number one and just 
throughout the last decade and a couple of years, I've been trying to r- read them all up to, I think it's like number 600 something is when it finally ends. And I, I have gotten to the, the portions with Madam Web there. And she's like an Oracle character that, you know, yeah, she can see into the future, the past. She can see everything at once. Uh, but she just helps out Spider-Man every now and then. But yeah, I don't see how she connects to like, I mean, I guess I can kind of see like basically they found a Spider-Man character that can look into the future. And that's the that's the story that they wanted to write. Um, or they just they have some other type of agenda that they wanted to make happen. They're like, we want to make sure that this happens. How can we do it? We'll pull any character that we possibly can. How can we pull these characters in? Uh, and I guess they picked Madam Web. And yeah, like I, I don't understand. You know, I'm interested in both like the art and business portions of film. And just I've been completely perplexed by Sony's business model with their Spider-Verse right now. I mean, honestly, yeah, she can see into the future, but the way she's using it, as far as I can see in the trailer, is it's just Spider-Sense. Um, they could have just made a Spider-Woman movie, and there are no, lots of different... No, this is different. Okay, I mean, yeah, it, it's just what I see from the trailer, as far as, like, the way that it's being utilized. Like, yeah, she sees stuff, and then... Friend, and I mean, this is just a trailer, not a movie. Like, nothing really comes of it except for the things where like she's using it in immediacy like she sees that like oh her car is about to run into something so she turns and makes sure the car doesn't run into something which is basically just spider sense but I mean I don't know like I said it's just a trailer I mean like they could do something more with it but why well in the trailer you see that she sees the future where these girls just get messed up by this dude like the dude just beats the crap out of them kills them yeah sucks out their essence whatever and then she does that, you know, that psychic thing where we all go back into her eyes or whatever. And it's like, oh, that's none of that Raven. Happened. Yeah, we used to do a that's so Raven. And she goes in there and she changes the. Yeah, but she only ju- like, like on the subway, like she only jumps ahead, like what, 30 seconds. Oh, so, yeah. She doesn't go that far. No. Yeah. So like that, that could just that could just be an advanced spider sense as far as I'm concerned. Like it's. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Like I said, they could have just done Spider Woman. For from what I can see, is what the what what. This is what I'm talking about when I say I don't understand what it is they're trying to do with that character. Why that character? Because it yeah. seems like what they're trying to do, they could have accomplished better just with a character that fits more what they're trying to do, like Spider Woman. Yeah, I feel like there are other Spider characters, well known Spider characters, but I don't know if they're just saving that for the Spider Verse movies or. If Disney got something on lock, I'm not sure. I know Silk was in the games, the Spider-Man game. I think they were teasing Silk from what I've heard. But like Silk, uh, all of the spider Man, Spider-Woman, like there's several spider characters out there that I think would be better suited for a protagonist role. It's just crazy how well Sony is handling like the animated side because those across the Spider-Verse movies are fucking awesome. Amazing, and I, yeah. I, I love them from beginning to end. And then you've got the live action side and it's so mm-hmm. mismanaged. And it's just like, what is the disconnect here? I think there's, uh, and I was listening to somebody else talk about it, and they made a good point that when it came to the animated, when they first were making the movie, Sony didn't really know, like whoever's in, I forget her name. She's in charge of like the whole Spider-Man, Spider-Verse and Sony. And they really didn't know about the animation. They were like, we... We don't know how animation works. We don't know. Like, you guys just do your own thing. So you got somebody competent like Lord and Miller, and they got some competent animators, and they were doing their own thing. Sony didn't didn't touch it because Sony had no clue. But right now, it seems like Sony thinks they know what they're doing with the live action because they're like, we've done live action before plenty of times. We made Spider-Man 1 and 2, which were some of the best superhero films out there, people will still say. so, But they don't. They think they know. But it doesn't seem like they know. And Amazon actually has Silk right now. But they're, because of the writer's strike, they're actually in some kind of legal debate with mm, okay. uh, with Warners or somebody out there. You just, you just think that Sony would see how well the animated movies did and the reception of the live action movies and then maybe think, you know, maybe we should let somebody else handle this. But I don't know. Wishful the thinking. Game. Yeah, the game they probably like had nothing to do with it, and the game has a great story. It's not even just about the gameplay. I played the mm-hmm. first one, 
great Spider-Man story. It's like one of the best spider stories out there. And I bet nobody from that, the movie department, I bet the live action movie department never came over to the video game side. And that's why they, they did well, but it's, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just business model wise. It doesn't make sense. The characters that they're pulling, it also doesn't make sense why they're still going forward when it looks like they can pull the plug. Because if you think about other failed universes, like the dark universe, once the mummy failed, they pull that plug quick because mm-hmm. they lost the money. And it's like, dude, Morbius did not do you, you, you barely broke even. What makes you think that Madam Web is going to do well? I think they're afraid to pull the plug on their Spider-Man characters because they know as soon as they do, Disney's going to snatch it up. Yeah. And they yep. see it as too much of a cash cow exactly. to let it go. Yep. And they, I don't think that, I don't know. I, I don't think that they should necessarily because I think that Spider-Man is a variable, very profitable franchise. And I mean, it's the most profitable X-Men and Spider-Man, like as, Marvel, those are your two top sellers. So I can understand them not letting it go to Disney. But they're, well, I can see why they're not letting it go to Disney, but I can't see why they haven't, why after Morbius, they haven't changed the direction with Craven and Madam Web. Cause it's like, do you guys really think that you're going to make, like, Morbius coming after Venom? People were like, all right, maybe. I feel like a lot of those ticket sales were people giving it a chance. But Madam Web and Craven, I just don't. I forgot I think, about what, that Craven the, trailer. Oh my god! Yeah, one of the two are going to flop and bomb. Uh, if not both. I'm really what wondering if do? it is a legal thing with the Spider-Man rights because I know that there was some conversation recently about the rights because they were going to expire. I think from the Ditko Skate. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. That's like the only thing I can think of is maybe like contractually they have to produce a certain amount of Spider-Man related media per year. I'm 90% sure that's true. Why I don't think so is because of how many they're making. It doesn't seem like, why would anybody sign that contract to begin with? See, unless they like redid their contract, but to have to make like at least like uh, a movie every two to three years, because Fox had that problem with Fantastic Four. That's why you have so many bad Fantastic Fours. That's why mm-hmm. you have that 80s Fantastic Four that didn't even hit theaters because they had to contractually make it. And that's why it, they kept making bad Fantastic Fours until they said, screw it, we'll sell it to Disney. But with this, they're making so many that if they did have a contract, Venom should be able to suffice for a contract of that type. I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it, that, that's what I'm saying. It's like, to me, it's just business-wise, I'm just, I want to know. Black Cat is also an underutilized character. Who? Black, Black Cat. Cat. I thought you said Spider Cat, which I, I would say. <laughs> I'd watch a Spider this. Cat. <laughs> they use her pretty well in the video games. Yeah, so I've heard, but I'm surprised we've not seen her in live action. They were going to try. They, uh, the Amazing yeah, Spider-Man with, Two, they brought in Felicity. Yeah, they were going to, and then it didn't work. With um, I'm forgetting her name. She was in Rogue One. Uh, Felicity Jones. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, but that movie failed, and then they pulled the plug for a little bit. So again, and uh, Warner Brothers CEO, CEO, CEO Slask, he shows that you can pull the plug at any minute. It was oh, like red carpet dog. premiere. Pull the plug. Uh, Everybody get back. Roll that carpet up. So now they're being <laughs> investigated. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, they're being investigated for canceling movies for tax write-offs. Oh. Uh, yep. Y- well, wait, you mean like, wait, like, wait. like Batgirl? Fuck. Yeah, so Batgirl, <laughs> and then most recently, there was a Wiley that got shelved for that reason. Uh, Wiley Coyote. Oh. For that reason, and because of that getting shelved they're now under investigation I, I see that face you made baron and it's worse than you think because it had john cena and it was all about wiley e. coyote suing acme which is actually kind of a cool idea <laughs> yeah actually I, t- I take back i take back my stink face because that actually that sounds kind of cool <laughs> yeah like that, that yeah that's actually a i think that's a good idea um and then i, I think people when i mix ideas with like john i like john cena actually i think um how the wrestlers we currently have acting. Oh, sorry. I don't know. Um, he seems like a cool guy. Like in interviews, I'd be like, yeah, he's a neat dude. But like his acting, I'm like, hmm. Maybe yeah, I'll not. take him over the rock. I'll take him over oh, Dave Bautista as well. Okay. Oh, yeah, God. Same. Bautista yeah, needs to stop. Bautista. And like the fact that he's like, I don't want to be. Okay. Bautista. Mm-hmm. Okay. He was, he was pretty good as Drax. Right. Okay. But. He recently came out saying he didn't want to be Drax anymore because, like, the whole thing is he doesn't want to be a comedic actor anymore. He wants to be a serious actor. 
And then if you look at him try to be a serious actor in things like, I don't know, Glass Onion, um, he, he falls short, in my right, opinion. Glass Onion, he was still, he was still a comedic. Though, yeah, like, yeah. He was the punchline, though, this time. More yeah. so. But he was also in that Shyamalan movie, too. Yeah. I don't but know. I, I've, like... I've stopped watching Shyamalan movies altogether. So. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> All right. We still got a lot to get through. So let's see. As long as we're talking about Marvel, uh, what if season two dropped a trailer? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing that happened. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to find the synopsises for like the different episodes and I couldn't find anything except for Captain Carter, which I don't really care for. But I was hoping that they would have it released. There's going to be a Christmas episode. We know that. <laughs> I've only seen one episode from the last season. It's the one that you showed me, Caitlin, which I thought was really good. It was the Doctor Strange one. And then we watched another one after that where like the Avengers were getting assassinated. And that was all right. But I don't know. Even what if storylines, I don't. I, it, it's my problem with the multiverse. Like It's my biggest issue with the multiverse and, and properties. So I don't. It's something that doesn't interest me. I feel like it's kind of, all right, it's whatever. Like, this doesn't, granted, you know, all fiction doesn't really hold a, a certain amount of weight, but I think this even holds less weight. I feel like my opinion about season two is going to be the same as my opinion about season one. None of it's going to be amazing. I will mm -hmm. enjoy every episode for what it is. Um, it looks like there's even going to be, like I said, a Christmas episode and like a Mad Max episode, which I'm here for. Um, and the best thing that's going to come out of it is the Funkos that I get to buy. Fair, yeah. <laughs> I liked the Killmonger one in the first season. I think I'd never watch the whole season, but because it, like, I don't know. Every anthology series is going to have ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I, will, uh, I will say, being as old as I am, and uh, being into comics for as long as I have been, what if is fun to me. It's not something I'm expecting something groundbreaking from, it's not something that I am, you know, expecting to add to the overall story of things, because that is what what if has yeah. always been. It just reminds it, me of a one shot. Yeah, like a fun one shot comic. Yeah, that is mm -hmm. what it's supposed to be. Uh, funny story. I do have a what if comic of I may have even talked about it on here before, but the title of it is what if Captain America was revived today? <laughs> and it was written in the 80s <laughs> nice so it's like oh you mean as opposed to being revived in like 2020 <laughs> <laughs> novel <laughs> I, think, I think I can see the appeal in it it's just it's a personal thing for me yeah yeah sure alright what we do in the shadows got a fifth season I'm here for it fucking fuck me up Fang daddy keep, bring it coming <laughs> <laughs> keep it coming yeah it was it was as goofy as every other season um i don't okay. think a lot of a lot of these shows they run on too long and you feel like they run out of things to do and run out of things to say and i do not get that fatigue with what we do in the shadows i was eagerly awaiting each episode as it came out i watched it on the day it came out uh i was mad that the rest of the episodes weren't available yet I, I had a lot of fun. Um, if you liked the first four seasons, watch yeah. the fifth season. Like that's there's not much else to say there. Um, Guillermo, uh, spoilers because it happens episode one of season five. But Guillermo finally pays somebody to bite him. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is a spoiler for me. I've watched the first three seasons, I think, and I really, really like the movie. I think I like the movie better than the series, but I do enjoy the series. It's funny, too, though, because, you know, we probably won't bring up any more of it, but that's not even the biggest spoiler of the. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Like I said, that that's episode one. <laughs> yeah, I do really like Guillermo, though. He's the actor is really, really taking off, too. He's doing so mm -hmm. much, which really good. what else is he doing? Uh, he was in Blue Beetle. Um, okay. He was in he was in a werewolf movie that I watched. Can't remember the name of it. Werewolf by no, goddamn! I was about to say Werewolf by Night again. Werewolf by Night, Werewolf by Night. <laughs> uh, uh, the Werewolf, uh, Werewolf Within. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. But which, which that one was? I think that one was pretty good, uh, pretty big. 
kind of, I guess. This could be um, just because it's the most recent season on my mind, but if you like Guillermo as a character, I feel like we get more out of him this season than we have any other season. Oh, absolutely. okay. Absolutely. I don't I don't necessarily like the direction his character went, but I I'm I'm cool with it. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll make it work. Um he was also in Puss in Boots, by the way. Oh, okay. The best character in such in a good the, movie. In the entire movie, he was the best character. Which yeah. character was he? He was the Chihuahua. Oh, Perito. <laughs> well, I love Perito. I'll get that second. Death was the best character in Puss in Boots. Death mm. was pretty great. I disagree. That the Perito that, was great, too. Perito <laughs> was pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he was also recently in the Harley Quinn cartoon. Okay. Uh, he was voicing Nightwing, which is... Oh, my gosh. He's hilarious. <laughs> wow. Okay. I saw a clip of that. I'm I'm gonna have to seek that out because yeah. uh, one of my favorite actors of all time normally does Nightwing, so I'll have to see how it stacks up. <laughs> nice. They do the whole Bat Family dirty in that show. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> Which is fine. Which and is Gordon. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fine because you know he's a billionaire, so mm-hmm. whatever. <laughs> All right. We kind of hinted at this already, but uh, One Piece live action happened. Um, I didn't watch the anime because there's way too many episodes for me. Um, (laughs) I didn't watch the live action, but I have heard from people who've watched both that they did a really good job with it. I'm actually watching the anime currently. I'm on episode. I'm about to finish like what I consider to be the second main arc, or at least the first one since they crossed the Grand Line and really get into the story. I'm on episode like 120 something and yeah, it's, it's a lot. Luckily I'm about to get to like episode 130 starts a filler. So that's nice. It's like, uh, it's like a little free space bingo for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip the filler. So it's going to feel like, oh man, now I'm on episode almost there at 200. Mm -hmm. I have considered watching one pace. One Piece? (laughs) Yeah. So, so there's a website where a bunch of fans of one piece have edited down one piece so like if you're familiar with like dragon ball z and dragon ball z kai um where like they like redid the whole anime and like made a bunch of scenes shorter and cut out a lot of filler um and not even just cutting out the filler like there might be a scene where like a character is powering up or didn't attack and like the after effect goes on way too long so like they'll take that minute and cut it down to like 10 seconds or 15 seconds and so they did that with one piece and they call it one pace. Um, okay. So now that I know that's happened, because look, I'm a huge Dragon Ball Z fan. I always have been. I've never tried to hide it. When I finally got my wife to sit down and watch Dragon Ball Z, I sat her down with Kai because I'm like, you do not need all of this. You need you need <laughs> this. And so one pace seems like if I'm going to dive in, that's going to be the way I'm going to do it. Yeah, I had a friend that watched the live action, and he was like, I kind of want to get into anime now. Like, I think oh, maybe I'll try watching the One Piece anime. And it's like, no, you do not want that to be your entry anime. There are way too many episodes. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it can be your entry anime. It's just going to be, that's a long entrance. You're going to be in that lobby for a minute. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. I, yeah, this is uh, probably like my second or third time trying it. I did get into it one time. Like, I was, I was really into it. And I stopped watching it because the the files I had, the legally downloaded files that I had, one of them was so out of sync that I just could not get it back in sync, and I just kind of, I just kind of fell over. But yeah, I'm back in it now. I've been watching it weekly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've been seeing the Crunchyroll account. I've been, I've been getting through it, <laughs> powering on. And like I said, I don't watch filler in anime, which you may think that, oh, well, that knocks out a good portion. One Piece is the longest anime and has percentage-wise the least amount of fillers. Bleach is actually the top i think it's like 60 percent of their episodes are filler Mm -hmm. but one piece is only nine percent it went anime way too quick they they have to spend way too much time waiting for manga to catch up when it comes to bleach yeah like they basically they they basically did like five volumes in the manga and they were like well let's make an anime (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's another anime i'm watching right now and it's that that one is trying my patience that one doesn't even have as many episodes as one piece and it's trying my patience right now the manga moves (laughs) so fast it moves so I, I, fast. I used to read the manga until I just mm-hmm. it it got to a point that I just did not like the story at yeah, all. They, that's fair. They just did something. It was just I was like this was a waste of time. That's fair. 
about the fourth time they leveled up their swords. I was like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> All uh, right, there's nothing you want to say, but yeah, you go. So, uh, also over on Netflix, uh, people have been saying Castlevania got another season. It's technically not true. Castlevania got a new series, Castlevania Nocturne. I watched all of the Castlevania anime on Netflix, and I don't think any of it was as good as Nocturne is. And that could just be my love of Richter Belmont. And they finally get around to Richter in this new series. And. When it comes to the action in this particular anime, Richter is fucking smashing heads, and I love it. Uh, anybody else watch it? No, I have to. It is on my it is on my list because I just I keep hearing about it. People just keep telling me to watch it. Have you watched the you, older seasons or the the previous? Oh series? yeah, I'm talking about the whole the whole series. Oh uh, okay. You can, can you watch Nocturne without watching the rest of the series? Absolutely. It's it's just like it's just like the Castlevania video games. You can jump in at any Castlevania video game and not have any played any of the older ones and you're okay. good to go. So yeah, you could just watch Nocturne because it has nothing to do with the other series. And if you haven't watched any of them, I probably recommend as, as good as I think the original series was, I would say just skip it and go straight for Nocturne because that's how good okay. Nocturne is. Sounds like less of a commitment too. It is. Yeah. 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 My wife would tell you that I'm telling you blasphemy. Because her favorite character, I've, I've been waiting for Richter. Richter, Richter is my heart character when it comes to Castlevania. But uh, she loves Alucard, which is uh, Dracula's son, and Alucard is all over the original series. Gotcha. He really put a lot of thought into his son's name, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Capcom! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I misspoke here. I know it's Konami. What do you mean? Dracula named him. <laughs> I actually, I think in the story, his mother named him. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Over on Disney Plus, we got an Ahsoka series. That we did. That we did. I liked it. I think I'd like it a lot more if I had watched any of the animated series, Clone Wars mm. or yeah. uh, or Rebels. Gotcha. Yeah. But it was still enjoyable. I'm not into the into the series i'm not really into star wars uh well, but yeah that's fine then yeah yeah i did the, though i did watch something from star wars this year the divisions the anthology there was an episode somebody told me uh to watch which is this animator that i really like they did secure the cows wolf wolf walkers and song of the sea and they also like they know my issue with star wars and they recommended that episode for me where this girl um she she takes her and her friends and they they run away from their job and she goes looking in this cave for something uh, and it was a fantastic episode that made me not like Star Wars even more because I'm like you guys can do this you guys can do <laughs> stories like this but you don't want to uh, so I forget what the episode was called but it was yeah it, like of course it was like I said I love that animation studio so it was beautiful animation and the way the story plays out and the reveal at the end. It was it was a good short. I love visions and I agree with your opinion that it makes me wish Star Wars would do more of the kind of stuff you see in visions. I think my mm. my biggest gripe with Star Wars in general, and I've said this before on the podcast, is they need to leave the Skywalkers the fuck alone and go yeah. go follow somebody else. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of that in Ahsoka, but they still can't leave the skywalkers the fuck alone that death star too i'm tired of that death star <laughs> yeah look i'd be okay with the death star as long as it had nothing to do with the skywalkers but yeah it's no, fucking fucking skywalkers man i'm done with them every other movie is about taking down the death star or somebody building a death star to the point that the last jedi i was like man we're almost done this movie no death star i'm pretty happy and somebody's like bring in the death star prototype <laughs> like i hate you guys so much is this in contract or something? Yeah, I mean, I watched some of the Clone Wars animated series. I never watched Rebels, but I was, like, excited for Ahsoka to come to live action uh, just to see, you know, where she ended up. But then I just I just wasn't interested in watching this at all. I think 
the Star Wars series, it's another thing like Marvel, like there's just too many of them. And uh, most of them I hear have been underwhelming. And a lot of them I just, I'll start, but then I just don't have any desire to keep watching. I started the Obi-Wan one because I was really excited for that one. And then I just stopped because it just wasn't holding my attention. Uh, I've heard great things about the one with Diego Luna. Andor. Who's a really Andor, yeah, sorry. Love Diego Luna. Um, he's a really favorite actor of mine, but even that was I hear it's really, really good, but it was very slow for me. <laughs> for me, I will say, like Ahsoka, I enjoyed, but I'm also more than willing to tell you that that entire series was just edging me with nostalgia. Ah, uh, okay. Just- it's a very fan servicey. Oh my gosh, yes. And and, it, and I like fan service. Anybody that listens to this podcast knows I love me some fan service. That was a lot of good fan service. I also think that there's a lot of good closure that came with it as well. Speaking of the Star Wars, or the Skywalkers. <laughs> Fucking um, Skywalkers. Um, but yeah, I thought it was pretty good. That I think that also, and I love, oh no. Is it Ray Winston? Is that his name? Is that... I, I've been getting people's names mixed up today. Who are we talking about? Ray Winston is the older guy. Uh, the, uh, the guy that played uh, Pulo in Rome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what character did he play in Ahsoka? I can't remember his name. Okay. Ray Stevenson. <laughs> Ray Stevenson. Ray okay. Stevenson. Dang British people with their names all the same. Um, <laughs> and uh, his, I, I don't want to... I've heard people say, oh, this is his best role ever. I don't want to say it is his best role ever. It was pretty damn good. He, he, I think the reason why people are saying it's his best role is because he brought so much to that show. He brought a lot to that show just off of his own acting and his own bearing. And, and the characters are cool too. So unfortunately he died <laughs> like right after that show was done. Why are you laughing? Oh, but actor. Yeah. Or the character. Wow, I thought you were like spoiling wow. something. Wow. I thought you were spoiling wow, the movie. I was Caitlin. like, Jesus. <laughs> wow. Caitlin. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you meant the actor. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I could I could pass monster. that up. I had to <laughs> I had to hammer that one home. But yeah, no, the actor the actor died. Yeah, I was just about <laughs> to ask too. Balin Skull, by the way, for anyone who's wondering what character we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Which I hate because I should know his name. Because he's Skull, and his apprentice's name, her, her last name is Hady. And that's like the uh, wolves of Norse mythology that chase the moon and the sun, respectively. Um, oh, her name was Femur or something. No, uh-huh. no Skull. <laughs> skull and Humorous. She's not very funny. Because <laughs> it's a bone. Anyways. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I did like it. As far as like the other stuff... Again, I'm really realistic with what I like and what I don't like and why I don't like them and why I do like them. Like, I was not a big fan of Obi-Wan. I was not a big fan of the Boba Fett, the Book of Boba Fett. Mm-mm. Um, well, anybody was. I really enjoyed um, Andor. And the reason why I liked Andor is Cause... because that movie was so fucking cyberpunk, it, it hurt. It was so cyberpunk. Yeah. They even, like, took some of that fucked around with that in the latest episode of man, uh, the latest season of uh, Mandalorian, because there were even some like super fucking cyberpunky scenes in the Mandalorian. And we're not Great. even just talking aesthetic. We're talking about the kind of themes that cyberpunk in general likes to tackle oh, is what man. Andor okay. is all about. Oh, Maybe I should be- try it again. Like I was like, I finished in the slump where they're like preparing to do this like heist, not heist, but their plan to infiltrate the base and it just like was dragging for me mm-hmm. you mean but i do keep hearing the, good things all the runners are putting together a job like it's cyberpunk yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i like cyberpunk but it's just that that part was dragging for me a bit <laughs> but yeah that's that's definitely oh especially like you know you know why they're doing these things mm-hmm. yeah you know when the whole thing like when they go into this heist and the whole thing falls apart it's like, oh my god, this is a cyberpunk movie, TV show, game, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. That's what this is. And then the final end, like finale scene, where you know you get that riot in the streets and everything like that, and that big speech 
by hologram, but still by a speech. That was great. That was great. So yeah. But again, as soon as I figured out that it was a cyberpunk movie, my brain took over and it was like, this is not Star Wars. <laughs> I try that sometimes. I'm like, yeah, this is not Star Wars. And then <laughs> bam, Skywalker. Death Star. <laughs> bam, Skywalkers, <laughs> man. <laughs> bam, that Death Star is called Skywalker. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, honestly, that's one of the reasons I really did dig Visions. Like, my favorite one was the Samurai one, but yeah, was fucking, fucking Visions is the shit. Moving on, though, from Star Wars, uh, Good Omens got a second season. Anybody else watch that? I do not, but I do like uh, David Tennant, and I saw that trailer for the second season, and uh, I enjoyed the trailer. It actually kind of made me want to go and watch and get into the show. I just don't I don't have the time at the moment. So. so for me, this is one of those things where I'm like, I can't watch this because I want to read the book first, and then I never read the book. Well, to be fair, season two doesn't have a book. They, they they made it just because the season one did so well. So, oh, so it's like off source material, it's like off book. Yeah, there is no book. There is no there is okay. uh, like Good Omens is the only book in that non existent series because it's just a book. So, yeah, but Neil Gaiman had plenty to do with the second se- the second season. Oh, okay, good. So, That's good. Yeah. Then. All right. Well, I won't get too much into to Good Omens then if I'm the only person here who watched it. But uh, Do you recommend uh, it? Um, I liked season one a little better. Um, okay. I was like, where's this going? <laughs> yeah, I liked season one a little better, but season two was still worth a watch, especially if you enjoyed season one. I'll be honest, if you if you watch season one and you're like, this is not for me, season two won't be for you either. Um, it's It won't change your mind, especially a good chunk of season two is... Neil Gaiman is all over fucking Tumblr. I don't know if you knew this or not. It's 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 his shit. Um, I am I am still active on Tumblr. Yeah. If anybody wants to track me down, I am active on Tumblr. Nice. Neil Neil Gaiman's all over Tumblr, and mm-hmm. um, basically Neil Gaiman read uh, what a lot of people liked about Good Omen season one and a bunch of their fan theories and what they thought the characters were like that wasn't explicitly stated in season one. And Neil Gaiman dove deep into that shit for season two, like and gave it all to the fans and was like, yep, you're right about all of it. Here it is in season two. (laughs) So which I think more creators should do, because there are so many creators who they write a story and they have in their mind the direction that it's going to go. And then they go and read these theories online. And when they when what's actually going to happen gets guessed they change direction because they're like, yeah, oh, I, I, I can't be that predictable. And Neil Gaiman just went like, yeah, you guys are all right. And like, I don't even think he had that in mind for the direction. He just gave it to the fans what they wanted. Like he just stole all of their ideas wholesale and went like, yep, that sounds good. And put it in the script. Um, not to mention, there's this whole joke on Tumblr where and Neil Gaiman dirty comments comments on like every post that anybody makes about this joke that he just enjoys setting David Tennant on fire because he does it over and over again throughout the series. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's plenty more of that. So <laughs> if you want to see David Tennant on fire, this is the show for you. I'm in. <laughs> OK, hopefully I'm not the only person who saw this one. Our flags mean our flag means death. Got a season two. I've and watched a few episodes. A few episodes. Okay. Mm-hmm. I watched the trailer. Trailer actually looked good. Uh, <laughs> and but I would say like to, to add more to it, I am interested in watching it because it looks like something that has what I like about talking about TT in it. Even though he's not a writer for it, he is one of the directors and executive producers, and he's in it. So I'm sure does he has. He not, does he not write it? No, he has no writing uh, credits in it. But I'm sure you know. He's, I'm sure he's still he improvs enough that they, they the could give him a writer though? credit. He's not a showrunner. He's an executive or or the producer. So I'm pretty. I'm executive pretty sure producer would be the showrunner, which would be in charge of the story and writing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he in is of writing, but doesn't write it. I would say. Yes, uh, like he probably got it, supervises it. So, but an executive producer in television that's a showrunner, so it would be his story. Regardless and he would have final say in the else. writing. Regardless yeah. of what his job is on set, you can tell he really digs his character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. It looks like that. Uh, 
because I think he also, you know, he's known for his comedy, but I think he does emotion and relationships really well. So that's what I'm interested in. Because I've also I've gone ahead and I finished uh, everything worth watching and Love and Thunder of his filmography. And I heard that the next goal wins isn't I don't know isn't being reviewed too well. No. So I don't know if I need that Watiti fix. I may, I may go ahead and watch this, especially now that it's like it's early on. You know, there's only two seasons. Yeah, that's me. I think I'm a little Taika Waititi out. <laughs> I'm not. Um, um, I will say, just to tie this back to a conversation we had earlier in the podcast, Our Flags Means Death, especially season two, is also about two very toxic people in a very toxic relationship, and they are exploring that and what they need to do to become better people in a better relationship. And apparently that's my type of series because I, I was fucking digging it, man. I got a series for you then because this year is apparently about toxicity. Last year was about uh, horrible rich people. This year apparently is about toxicity. Uh, my favorite series this year and just one of my now like one of my favorite series in general uh, was Beef. Oh, I started watching oh, that okay. actually. And I, I have been digging it. I haven't finished it yet, but I did start watching it. Yeah, those two, they're not even in a relationship, which is something that I like. Because now we can explore the toxicity of people who are not even in a relationship or in an intimate relationship. And those two are just some awful, awful people. And they, the word toxic gets spread around a lot and it gets misused. But those are some individuals who just make the lives around them worse right. and slowly brings them down. Uh, it's a, but yeah, that's a, I definitely recommend that series, especially if you like that kind of, those kind of characters, flawed characters. and you know, whether or not seeing them in redemption or just see like how they interact, that's a great show. And then there's just so many things technical about it that are amazing. All right. And the last thing I'm going to bring up and anybody else can feel free to bring stuff, other stuff up after we're done this particular conversation. But the last thing I'm going to bring up is Nintendo has announced a live action Legend of Zelda movie that they will be making with Sony. We don't know a whole lot about it, except for a few people who are attached to the project and that it will be live action. I am excited. I I was excited when I heard about <laughs> Mario Brothers um, and I loved it. So I think I'm just going to stick with I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good reaction, I think. <laughs> cool. I'm I don't know. I I do like Legend of Zelda. Uh, I can't say that I'm the biggest fan because it's just been it's been years apart since I've played some of the games. But I did like it's it's my first ever open world game I played, which is Ocarina of Time. Loved it as a child playing on Nintendo 64. And I was actually it's, it's funny because I was thinking about this while lying down last night. I was thinking about like how could like what story are they going to pick and how can they make it one movie? Like just thinking about like how expansive, even though Ocarina of Time came out, was it the 90s? Like that story is just it's so it's huge and as long it goes over time periods and I'm like and I know Breath of the Wild is a massive game as well so like I don't know I just I'm wondering what which one they would take and what they can do uniquely with it other than just the design and fanfare I think the, I feel like it, the obvious oh, candidates will be the original Legend of Zelda like for NES or yeah. or Ocarina of Time because everybody loves that shit. But let's let's talk about what we know and what there there are things that we know that before we start speculating about what we want it to be or what we think it'll be, there are things that we know that make me excited and things that we know that make me not so excited. So first of all, we know the producers will be Shigeru Mi Shigeru Miyamoto himself and Avi Arad. Um, Shigeru Miyamoto being a producer makes me really excited because zelda's his creation and he actually posted on x saying that he has been working on the the movie for many years now quote unquote and uh that he asked arad to produce the movie with him but if you look at the credits of avi arad you're looking at venom and a few other spider-man movies and uncharted um you know what studio is producing this uh sony oh but yeah. director doesn't give me too much confidence either. Yeah, so the director is, is Wes Ball. And um yeah, there's Oh wait, Wes Ball? Yeah. 
So no he's known is. for the Maze Runner trilogy, and he's also going to be directing the new planet, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I did read about that, which I don't know. It seems like he seems like a he, I guess people have confidence in him. I thought Maze Runner, Maze Runner uh, was it just the first one or the whole trilogy? Uh, the whole trilogy. I like the first one. Uh, the trilogy, not so much. There was something in the second one. I think the second one has like one of just the best running scenes in in film. So like direction wise, if that was you know, seeing how much of that was his creation, I guess some like there could be some intense moment with Zelda. My only issue with the uh, with the producers and Sony directing it is that Sony takes a lot of control over their products, and I don't get any confidence when I hear that the creator of the IP is a producer because I think a lot of times all they did was sign off on it and gave it their, their blessing to be made. Uh, we saw that the last thing I can think of is Terminator. Uh, the last Terminator that came out and James Cameron was a producer on it, but he's like a producer on all of them. doesn't mean that they're, they're good. It's just that, well, this was their original creation and they're going to get some of the profit. So we'll put their name up as a producer credits and, and, you know, tax purposes Seeing that he was writing his whole life, maybe. I just don't know how much Sony is really going to care. Here, this could just be me being optimistic. But if it were anyone other than Shigeru Miyamoto and Nintendo, I would 100% agree with you. But a long time ago, uh, no, Nin- Nintendo made a movie for Mario Brothers, and it was live action, and it was fucking terrible. And since <laughs> then, Nintendo has been so ironclad with their properties as far as what you're allowed to do with them and whatnot to the point where when they put Bowser and Wreck-It Ralph, they made them change how Bowser holds his teacup because they were like, Bowser wouldn't drink tea like that. So the fact that it's Nintendo and Shigeru Miyamoto makes me think that we're going to see more of Miyamoto's vision than anyone else's. Once again, that could just be me being optimistic. But that being said, there's a lot of Zelda fans who don't like Miyamoto's vision. And we've seen that time after time because we saw Twilight Princess. And then right after Twilight Princess, Wind Waker came out. And Wind Waker, uh, Miyamoto himself said that is the closest to the way he wants Link to look that it had ever been in the series. Um, because the cell shading technology finally caught up to where Miyamoto wanted it. And that's how he sees Link. That's how he sees that series. And people were upset, like like raging about how Link looked in that cell shaded style. They were like, why is he so cartoony? Why is he such a little kid? Like, we want that ultra realistic, ultra gritty adult Link. And that's not Miyamoto's vision for Link. So I think... We are going to get Miyamoto's vision. I also think there's going to be a lot of Zelda fans who are disappointed, just like they were disappointed in Wind Waker. Hopefully those fans don't talk to Sony. Hopefully Sony never finds out those fans exist, because Sony wants to make fans happy. Sort of. Again, that's why I like... Because that's what happened with, you know, with Spider-Man 3, and kind of what they're doing with Spider-Man, but it doesn't make sense what they're doing now. Uh, but they like to make... If anything, they like to make fans happy. That's why they want to do Sinister Six, and that's why they did Venom. Now, hearing, yeah, it is Nintendo, that it, that is probably the most promising thing. If they have a clause in their contract that says they can pull out if something goes wrong, if they no longer have the creative hold they do, then yeah, I'll give it give it some more trust because, yeah, Nintendo, and yeah, it's been how many years since Super Mario Brothers? Like, they, they were serious about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they are close to the chest about how what they let other companies do with their characters and their stories. So, I don't think... Sony will get as much control over this as they do of other properties. I could be wrong, but I think Nintendo would have made a contract with them ironclad as far as what they get to do with it. I wonder what actor they're going to get with that big of a head for Wind Waker. Cause is, isn't that the one that was on the Wii U? Uh, it was originally on GameCube, but yes, it did get put on the Wii U. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then I'm okay. It's the one where he sails the ship for like the entire game. Yeah. And I remember, I was playing that game and I was getting real close to beating it. I got all the map pieces together and it was like, all right, now you just got to go ahead and sail to all these points to find it. I said, I'm done. I'm done. Like, <laughs> you need me to do what? This I is think, like for people who want to do 100% completion. Like, I'm not doing this. 
I think we'll get uh, a little bit more of a classic Zelda story than Wind Waker. I don't think we'll see him sailing the seven seas in this movie, which is why I think we'll most likely get either the original Legend of Zelda story or Ocarina of Time. I think if we are going to get like a weird one, it's even what the one I'd want. It's the one I think that would be most likely if we're not getting a standard one, if we're going to get a weird one, I think we'd get Link's Awakening. I which remember if, that one. That's the one that takes place on Koho Lint Island where he's trying to awake the windfish from the giant egg at the top of the mountain. Mm. Actually, Oh, to- I remember now. Mm-hmm. They, they remade it for switch recently yeah. and the remake was really good. Yeah. It was originally made for game boy. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm pretty sure I played that one. I think also they should just, if they're going to go ahead with a, you know, with one of these stories right off the first movie, they should be committed to a trilogy. Like if maybe Link's Awakening can get by with just one movie, but if they do something like Ocarina of Time, don't do that. We're gonna do one movie, kind of close it, kind of play it safe. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. We'll do a, a second and third one because you see a lot of times they'll do that first one. If it makes the money, then the second one is the one with the cliffhanger and goes into like the full overall story. I think they should just go all in with a trilogy. So I'm pretty sure it'll make us money. Like it's it's gonna have to do really bad not to make us money. They're gonna have to do something very odd. Yeah, even if, even if it's a bad movie, people will go out and see it just because it's Zelda. Yeah, yeah, you, and you have so many demographics that are going to be interested in it. I mean, I'd love to see them just say "fuck it" and do Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom because they're they're fantastic games. Um, a pink trilogy we would need for that, from what I've heard. Like, I just heard that game is massive, but I don't know if that's because all the the side stuff or is it because of the main story? It's the side stuff. You c- if you just mainline the story, you could you could beat that game in a matter of hours, like just a couple of hours. But that's okay. the, that's the thing about it. And like, not to get too much into a rant that I already did on our Zelda episode, but that's what Zelda, that's what Miyamoto's original vision for Zelda was because he got inspired from the game for the game inspiration for the game, just from going out into like the woods around his house when he was a little kid and exploring the forests and the caves. And it's always supposed to been about be about exploration. And that's what the first game was. Literally. They just dropped you in a world and said, go, they didn't even tell you what your objective was or anything like that. No, they gave you a sword. No, they don't even do that, because if you don't go in the cave on the like, (laughs) yeah, like you have to go find the sword in a cave where a guy says it's dangerous to go alone. Take this and you have to go get it. You say it like that, but there's just a hole right there. Yeah. I mean, like, no, you want to. But that's that's the beauty of it. You want to go explore that cave. You want to go see what's in it. They don't tell you, hey, go to that cave. They don't tell you what it is that you want to do. You want to do it. You want to be the explorer. You want to be the adventurer. And that's what Zelda should be about. Um, And it's what it was about the original game. It's what it's about in Breath of the Wild. Because 90% of that game is not what it tells you to do. It's just, hey, there's a thing over there and I can see it and I want to go see what it's about. And that's a difficult thing to capture in a movie. So... We'll see. Um, so you said that was your last one. Mm-hmm. I can go into a lightning round. Let's do want. it. Just go for it. So lightning round. I'm just going to bust some out. Uh, going off of the assumption that the writer's strike started May 2nd and ended November 10th or something. Sure. Okay. I'm here for it. All right. TV shows. You ready? Lightning round. Secret Invasion. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, didn't watch it. it. Sucked. You don't have to. Um, Twist of metal. <laughs> Twist of metal was the thing that happened. I want to watch that so bad. I watched like one episode because like you can watch the episode for free if you don't have a subscription to the streaming service that it's on. And I really liked it. Um, I'm really intrigued. I want to watch the rest of it, but I don't want to pay for another streaming service. I I actually watched it. It's actually really good. It was surprising. <laughs> And it does have a moment and then when it's like it's full out what you remember from actually playing Twisted Metal. Because yeah, all the other stuff is not from what the you play in the game. But it's 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 a lot of fun. It's a show that's a lot of fun, doesn't take a lot of commitment, it's not heavy. Well I might I recommend to, it. I might have to do a one month free trial. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can I got it done in just like a week. I was just watching a couple episodes a night. See, or you can do your one month free trial, listeners, or Yoho. You can do it the fun way. All right. <laughs> Next up, Fiona and Cake. Fiona and Cake. That's a great. You want it? 
we've been talking about toxic relationships and stuff like that. This is a classic, you know, it's you start out looking at this relationship thinking one of them is toxic. And then you slowly find out that the it was the other one that was toxic the whole time. And mm. their their viewpoint on the relationship is what was toxic. So that, that was really cool. I, too, um, have a toxic relationship with cake. <laughs> <laughs> all day. All day, every day. The Continental. I didn't hear good things. I skipped it. Yeah. Oh, really? I thought it was fun. I, 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 four. I didn't I didn't even watch four. I felt I feel like I, I'm I got John Wick fatigue, and maybe it's been long enough that now I can go watch John Wick four and go watch the Continental, and I won't have that fatigue anymore, and I'll really enjoy it. Crapopolis. I don't know if anybody's heard of this one. I started watching it, and I didn't like it at all. It is it is silly, stupid. That's about it. I got That's like got. <laughs> I got like five episodes in, and I was like, I'm done with this. This is over. Next up, Gen V. I believe that's from the uh, world of the boys. Yes, it is. I'm halfway through. I'm I'm not caring for it too much. I'm going to finish it because I love the boys. Uh, but if a lot of people were thinking that the boys was going to be just a superhero film that is adult and all they do is throw guts everywhere and make sex jokes. And the boys turns out turned out to be much more than that. But Gen V is, is kind of, it, it actually fits that bill more. It is. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, seen. I've watched four episodes. I've seen three penises so far. Okay, three yeah, out of four. That, that ratio was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a. It, you're you're not you're not breaking it yet. Is that is that a breaking point? Okay. No. Uh. Mm, no. And like I said, I'm I'm going to stick with it because I, mean, I really like the boys. Boys season three was amazing. Uh, uh, it did a lot of things writing wise and did a lot of things with his characters that I, I was not expecting that shows that they they're actually mature with right. their writing however gen v is it feels very childish and got, when got you find out them. yeah when you find out who the writers are too for that show it makes sense okay next up is the fall of the house of usher oh i watched that i just finished that it, i thought it was pretty good i thought it was good too i haven't watched, watched it but my wife has fantastic things to say about it i mean i'm a big edgar Allan poe fan so if you are then you're gonna like this I don't think I like, I think Bly Manor is still my favorite of the miniseries, though. So. But I think Bald House Usher is probably second favorite. Um, and then, and again, I'm just, this is just a very arbitrary list. I'm just picking out the ones that interest me or I watched or whatever. Or geek um, in general. Or geek in general, yes. Uh, John Carpenter's Suburban Screams have not seen it, but it came out. But it is John Carpenter of who I do like we John Carpenter. About. We did <laughs> about in a certain other podcast and may have something coming out of that involving John Carpenter. So that should be fun. Uh, Goosebumps apparently Get. came out. I've heard so good things. Out. Um, good. I mean, I'm glad that they're trying to, you know, give R.L. Stein some money. That's fun. I guess that is the guy that wrote Goosebumps, right? Yes. Um, then there's like a couple other things that I actually have on this little list that I have, but nothing really. Wheel of Time season two was really good. Oh, was that during the thing, too? Yeah. I didn't even know they did a season two. Yeah, I think the season two was better than the first season. Now, I've never read the Wheel of Time books, but I think that Amazon actually does a really good job with its adaptations. I've been very pleased with Amazon. liked the Lord of the Rings adaptation. Me, too. A lot of people are hating on it, but I loved it. Yeah, I did too. I liked it a lot. It was better than Willow. Aww. Ouch. Willow? I never, I never heard of it. Is it? Is there somewhere I can watch it? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you can check it out on Plex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now we're in the movies again. Assuming the writer strike started on May second. Also, I, I just like what? to point out. I just like to point out that the reason you didn't know about uh, Wheel of Time season two, and the reason that you listener we're not talking about the one thing that you really wish we were talking about, is not because we're bad at researching for our podcast. It's just because we were so in solidarity with the strike that we just didn't didn't do any of these things. Like that's that's no, the reason. Uh, honestly, that's <laughs> not it. The reason is that Amazon did not. <laughs> at all <laughs> so you're fine <laughs> you are fine you are absolved because there was no promotions for that show actually i do have one more tv show during that time that i think okay. is worth mentioning 
Mm-hmm. It? It's a uh, Scavengers Reign. It's hmm. an uh, adult animated show, and by adult I mean it's, like it's mature, mature themes, and there's some violence in it, gore. But it's it's been getting a lot of praise recently. The season just ended. Uh, I believe it's just a mini series, but in a time where you know a lot of animation is getting pulled from streaming, it seems like, and they're cutting back. It's it's really good, and they took a chance again with the adult animation. It's uh like the best. If I was describing one word, is captivating. Like the the designs of the creatures about these people who crash land on a planet and they're trying to find their way back. But the show it it seems to have a theme of like relationships, not intimate relationships, just relationships with each other, and then the the ecosystems relationship between organisms. Uh, and it's just it's beautifully animated when it comes to design. It has a lot of emotion to it when it's not saying anything, which is probably complimented by how great of a score it is so i definitely if you're looking if you like animation uh, if you like nasuka valley of the wind too which it seems like to be inspired hey. by it's i definitely recommend it hell yeah um, four episodes i in. will like it also speaking of animation invincible 2 is also out now oh that's right oh yep all right movies i haven't started yet all right uh, hit us wait, baron oh, all right again it's it, it, taking into account the strike happened on the second guardians galaxy volume three Oh, we didn't. Out. We didn't talk about that. It came out on the third. We didn't. Oh, that's right. And like we, we purposely didn't. I remember purposely not talking about that on the podcast. Yep. Yep. Fucking, I cried. I'm not gonna lie. It, Fucking, it was great. Yeah. I loved it. They horribly they butchered Adam Warlock, but I like Adam Warlock too. I don't care. Yeah. They did butcher that character, but he was fun. <laughs> he fucking killed that guy in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to, I still have oh, to watch. I actually do plan to watch that. We got oh, our first. Okay. We got our first MCU fuck. Oh yeah, yeah. I heard. Yep. Mm-hmm. Just right on the couch. Mm-hmm. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, they said the word fuck. That's yes. right. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I, I imagined something else. Next. Oh, did you, did you know they remade White Man Can't Jump? Yeah, and actually, I really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I didn't get to watch it yet. I've heard nothing but good things about it, so I'm gonna. Have I, to watch uh, it. I I talked to Billy about it a little bit. Guild member oh, yeah. Billy and uh yeah. I, I, I talked to you about it too. I I was expecting it just to be like this little cash grabby thing where they just remake the old movie and like it's got a surprising amount of depth to it and really? um does a whole lot better of a job exploring the themes that the first movie claimed to explore. So if if look if you like emotional movies and you like basketball movies, which I like both of those things, go watch it. I can't think I of a will. non-emotional basketball movie. That's true. Seems like that's always the thing they go for. Yeah. <laughs> Especially Air Bud. Oh, what's that God. new one? What's that new Adam Sandler one? I really like that one too. Oh, I actually heard that was good. Hustlers. Yes. Was the Hustlers? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> it, it might be, but like either way, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that one too. All right. Next up, another one I just can't believe that we couldn't talk about. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Oh, my God. Do oh, we wow. not talk about that? On I know you and I talked about that. Yeah, we couldn't. Uh, I know I, you and I talked about that. I, I can't believe we didn't talk about that on the podcast because no, we had to have. I, I remember the conversation about uh, maybe we did have it off the podcast. But I remember the conversation about the theory. I'm pretty sure we had it off the podcast. You the know theory about listening? Gwen Stacy being trans. and if, Oh, if, yeah. If, if you can find the instance where we were talking about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and any of our other podcasts between now and May, go ahead and find it. Let us know. We'll give you a, a nickel, a shiny nickel. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah oh, it's so good. So good. Fantastic. So good. Yeah. Fuck amazing movie. I wish we I wish I'd have known we missed that one. I would have oh. dedicated more time to it in the regular podcast. Guild decree. I'm dropping a guild decree. Fucking do it. I think okay. I know where this is going and I fucking love it. You ready? I think I do. You re- oh, wait. Okay, sorry. I have to do this for the spawn, but I'm going to need you to back me up on the other, uh, the other, uh, okay. Guild decree. Okay, okay, go for it. You ready? Yeah. Guild Decree, Peter Parker in Gwen Stacy's world. Okay. Is As trans. the lizard. Okay. Is trans. Okay. Okay, I'll take that one. And then I'll just go ahead and hit, we hit you with the guild decree that Gwen Stacy, as depicted in Across the Spider-Verse, is trans. Boom. Yes. 
Spawn's going to be so proud of us. Mm-hmm. Because I will say, like, like, but I, I didn't even think about the P- Peter Parker thing before. It didn't even cross my mind. I think we all know Gwen Stacy. Gwen Stacy trans. No. Problem. What sold it for me was the trans flag on Captain Stacy's jacket because and, there's and no why no else other would he reason. have it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then the spawn brought up Peter Parker. Also, I was like, you know what? I'm not against that. And it it kind of it kind of I think I like it. So we're yeah. Anyways. But I yeah, like the first you? movie the best though. Fair. I think the first one was better. Really? Fair. No, I thought yeah. the second one was better. I think it took the, me it took me a couple like like a week or two to finally admit it, but I was like I do like the first one better. I think the first one I think it's tighter. It's probably like the, the think, best thing has yeah. come for it. I think the only reason I like the first movie better than it the second tighter. movie is because it's a complete story. Whereas like we get this huge cliffhanger at the end of mm-hmm. the second one. Uh oh, but I, so I am too. I am so fucking ready for Wiles Morales. Um, yeah. Let's. Oh, is that fucking, what they call him? Uh, yeah, because it's like the Wario thing, where like you got Mario and Wario, so they're saying <laughs> like they call it. And Miles like, and it's also there's like a little, uh, there's a cut piece of animation that was originally going to be in the movie, and they're calling it the Wiles teaser. Um, mm-hmm. And it's on, it's on the Blu-ray, and it's also available on YouTube. You can look it up. Uh, where uh, Wiles is out with his uncle, like doing stuff. And it's fucking awesome. I'm ready for it. I'm pumped. But yeah, we should probably move on to the next. <laughs> well, one thing, one thing I need to point out. Yeah, they they did my boy dirty in that movie. I will say that. Which boy? Ben Riley. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. That that's my favorite Spider-Man. Yeah, <laughs> Spider-Man. yeah that's probably my funny. my favorite outside Peter. Yeah, but it, it, he was funny. And, I, he was know, funny. I'm getting treated on all these movies because Miles is my favorite. Um, I love Miles. Next, next up, I haven't watched, but I need to watch Asteroid City. It's uh, Wes Anderson. Yeah, I haven't watched it either. I gave up on Wes Anderson a while ago. Really? Uh, I mean, guess it's, every movie he does is the same thing. So yeah. I, I guess I can get Yeah. <laughs> I love Fantastic um, Mr. Fox. So one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh, that's so good. True. So good. Um, next up, this is going to be fun. The Flash. Nope. Skip. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> next. <laughs> the best thing in that movie, Supergirl. Oh, I, yeah. I, I hope she gets into the main world. Like, I was so, so excited for Tina Supergirl. Yeah. She deserves more than Look, that I wasn't, movie. I wasn't they, even excited about Michael Keaton Batman. If they really wanted to shelve a movie for tax purposes, we should have gotten Batgirl and they yeah. should have shelved fucking Flash. Yeah. 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 Um, Next up is Elemental. I believe it's Pixar. I did not see it. Yeah, Pixar. Another under-marketed film, but I've heard good things. I've seen it seven times. Wow. Not my choice, I'm sure. Uh, It's it's my daughter's new favorite watch it over and over again movie. Gotcha. I was about to say, somebody has a kid. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was okay. Yeah. Uh, That's where I'll give it. Um... But I mean, the the I think it was okay. But the theme behind it's really, really good. So yeah, um, yeah. Um, I mean, it explores it, it. It explores the themes it needs to explore as about as well as any other Disney Pixar kind of deal. Like it could go deeper and it could be better, but it's what you expect from Disney Pixar. Right. Next up, I I don't I don't know. The, I yeah, this kind of fall. The, yeah, this definitely falls into our realm. But I don't know if the studio was struck or anything like that. But we just weren't talking about movies. Right. It's a movie called The Blackening. If you haven't I seen saw it, it, I thought that that was so fucking stupid that it was funny. It was so good. I actually, I, I actually like that. I've seen it three times now because I showed it to two other people after I saw it in theater with my brother. Mm-hmm. And I also, I just have a lot of respect for that movie because so I think it's, I think it's, if it was made a lot earlier in time, we would have got something like Soul Plane or something that exploits, yeah. uh, black foolishness and this was more laughing with and more having fun with a black experience and not so much laughing at black people and stereotypes like there were things in here that my brother and i were laughing about because like yeah we know that family member like (laughs) yeah that is a thing that is probably more common with black people i was like yeah i I say that sometimes that's funny yeah i have a lot of respect for the movie and i think yeah it's a good movie yeah i enjoyed it next up indiana jones and the dial of destiny We have a whole podcast. We talked that. about that extensively on our podcast. <laughs> I didn't watch Crystal Spoiler. Skull, and I didn't watch this one. Uh, spoiler: I don't like Indiana Jones. 
I don't mind Indiana Jones. I did not like this movie was too long. That's still my biggest issue with this movie. It's too long, and the ending, I mean, the beginning is ridiculous on a lot of levels. There's definitely stuff they could have cut out. I feel Um, my opinion on Indiana Jones, either pick Raiders or pick Temple of Doom. Watch one of them. You don't have to watch any other Indiana Jones movie. Mm. You can skip Temple of Doom. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'll say just watch Temple of Doom just to understand the the political climate. But yeah, just for the iconic scenes in Temple of Doom. Honestly, I'd I'd prefer Raiders, like if you're only going to watch one. But yeah, just watch one of those movies and then don't watch any of the others. That's my opinion. Me, Last I know Crusade. other people don't Last like Crusade's it. Last Crusade's my but... favorite. Last Crusade is the absolute best one there is. Because yeah. not only because, and, and I'm not I'm not trashing your opinion. I mean, obviously, sure. but I think that the Last Crusade had the best production value. It's hard to describe. I don't have the words to describe it, but there was something about the production value that I really, really enjoyed. It also feels like it it, it encompassed the era that it was made. And on top of that, Fair. the marketing that went on with at the same time, I remember commercials of things that they used Indiana Jones to market. Like, I think they did McDonald's. I think they did like some sodas, a Pepsi, I think it was. It, it was crazy. I, I loved it. Loved it so much. It was an experience. The whole thing was an experience. So, yeah. Yeah, I would say that's my second favorite is the Last Crusade. Also, Sean Connery is great in that. He had me cracking up. He has mm-hmm. some funny lines in it. But the beginning of it is awful as far as like prequels oh, go. Oh, yeah, very beginning is bad. <laughs> With the it's fake perfect. giraffes <laughs> just popping out. Your fake what? giraffe popping up. It's like whack-a-mole. Also, that was I pretty think- much like we got a whole exposition dump of how he got everything. We found out how he got his hat, his whip, that's how he got perfect. afraid of snakes. All right. Yeah, you're right. I do hate those tropes. You're right. Okay, yeah, but after all in that, 10 minutes. That was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other than that, um, I like the Dial of Destiny. Um, there are definitely some things I would have changed for sure, um, but I like the theme of it. Even the hokey time travel shit, I was fine with. The only changes I would have made, or one big change I would have made, since they were leaning that hard into fan service anyways, put Key Cake One in that. Yeah. Just put him in there. Hey, no, nah, he deserves better. <laughs> nah, nah, throw him in there. It's all right. He would he, love he to would be act- there. He yeah, would he love to be there. Would. Bro, yeah. have fun. He, he probably would have made it better. Everybody would like. Yeah, everybody would it. agree that was the best part. So. He would, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Next up, haunted mansion. I didn't watch. I was it. actually wanting to see it, but I skipped it. It I, was. I, I will- it was better than the Eddie Murphy movie. Not uh, hard. That's, yeah, that's not a high bar. But unless you are like one of those diehard fans of the ride, because there are plenty of people out there who are, it's yeah. it's skippable. Fun fact, that was the Spawn's first haunted house ever. Oh, no. actually, let me bring this up. If you want a good Haunted Mansion haunted mansion movie, the fucking Muppets did that shit right. So oh. actually, skip really? this one. Go watch the Muppets one. That's fair. That's fair. I've also heard that theories that Crimson Peak is basically the Haunted Mansion. Um, look it up. <laughs> I feel like that's more or less confirmed. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm a Crimson Peak fan just because it's classic gothic. Yeah, I still need to see them. Another big one that I was really happy to see, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Fuck yeah. I enjoyed the hell out of that movie. I love so much about it, except for like probably the last 20 minutes I wasn't down with. But everything else, yeah, I thought was great. Yeah, the the Cole Kaiju thing was a bit much. But like the the characterization of the turtles, uh, they knocked it out of the park. I'm here for if if they want to make more content with those turtles, I'm here for it. Yep. Yeah, so. Actually, they they hit the teenager feel I think yeah. better than any literally any other property has. Even yeah. though I prefer like the much darker ones. Th- yeah, this even one was the unique. Comics. Even even the original comics, I think that they hit the teenager demographic way better. Also, best use of the word mollywop. <laughs> <laughs> He's mollywopping me. <laughs> That was my favorite line. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, but we actually talked about Doran. Sorry, I don't mean to no, uh, crowbar yes, ourselves please, in. But please, please do that. Please promote your podcast <laughs> on our podcast. We talked about uh, Old Boy and how Old Boy's, uh, their famous fight scene, that, that hallway fight scene. The TMNT probably does the best recreation of that in this. And they do it through a, uh, through yeah. a montage yeah, of animation. We actually had that same conversation. We just didn't talk about TMNT. Yep. <laughs> we did we did talk about old boy in the hallway scene we talked about it around the uh the 20th anniversary for old boy 
Yeah, that's when we did our. Yeah, our that's when we did ours as well. <laughs> <laughs> we should have just collabed then. <laughs> Yeah, because at um, that point in time, I was like, we can't talk about new movies, but this is an old movie. It's not being struck. Let's talk yeah. about this Ooh. shit. Loophole. <laughs> Next up, what was a movie? Anyway, let's go to Gran Turismo. That was a movie that happened. I don't, I wouldn't imagine any of us have seen it. Um, Blue I have it, but I've actually heard that there's a switch, like midway through the movie, where all of a sudden it becomes really good. Like, it starts off really bad, and then it switches and is a really great movie. Weird. So I am curious to watch it at some point. I'll probably see yes, it eventually. Sam. Yeah. Um, next up is Blue Beetle, a movie I didn't hate. I didn't see it, but I did love that trailer. <laughs> trailer was fun. The movie, though... Call, straight out calling out Batman in the trailer. The movie, though, was something. I, well, I'm going to have to leave right now and watch it. <laughs> it it's, um, it's definitely a mix of, like, three different movies. If you watch it, tell me what you think one, which ones they were. I think I can um, tell from the trailer. <laughs> Spy- <laughs> Spider-Man's a gimme. Spider-Man is a gimme. Yeah, the origin, yeah. Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to just hit a couple of ones that I'm not familiar with at all, but they look interesting. A Haunting in Venice. The Kill Room. Is that Joaquin Phoenix or Joe Manganiello? <laughs> uh, Joe, this Joe Manganiello mannequin. Yeah. Gotcha. He's a cool dude. Mm-hmm. I've heard. I have what? What you? <laughs> what's your beef, man? <laughs> Joe, that's a lot of beef. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's all real. <laughs> I can't top that. Um, uh, Expendables Four is a thing that happened. Yeah, uh, this thing, this thing. I don't, I don't even. I'd never even heard of these ones. I love how as you're getting closer to the end, you're like struggling because all this crap came out because strike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. That was that was about it. Wait, didn't That's Fast all- and the Furious come out during that time? I tried not to get any. Hungry. When aren't they coming out? Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably. Sorry. I didn't know. That. <laughs> um, did they? Yeah, because they got they got over they were one of the ones that got overshadowed. I'm pretty sure that was after Guardians of the Galaxy. It was they could follow that week, mm-hmm. or maybe it was just right before the strike. I don't know. I but mentioned yeah, it pre recording, but Bottoms. Oh yeah, Bottoms. Yep. I was disappointed. Caitlin okay. liked it. Hey. I feel like also for me, a lot of it is nostalgia for movies that I liked, but like movies that I watched growing up, coming of age movies, romantic comedies. But make it sapphic and make it bloody, and I'm here for that. Hey, I love bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was uh, one other big one, though. Uh, <laughs> Killers of the Flower Moon. Loved him so much, he became one. <laughs> <laughs> that was a power move. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, Martin Scorsese. Yeah, really good. That was during the strike. Oh, do we not give him any attention either? I don't know what the... Mark, I think delicious. I feel like I'm at war with Martin Scorsese. I, I feel like I'm at war. <laughs> does it take place uh, in New York? Uh, yes, yes. I'm in a gang. Um, <laughs> but I feel like I'm in at war with Martin Scorsese because of his hate of essentially anything that isn't his movies or like his movies. Gotcha. I don't think so. I mean, I've definitely seen him support a lot of filmmakers and he's one of the biggest supporters of international film as well he's constantly finding films to restore from countries that are small and may not have that resources to restore films martin scorsese dislikes the studio system he hates the studio system and it's, it's definitely fair especially now well always it's detrimental to the industry that he worked hard to build up because he, you know, he came out of time that was around that film school generation that was very anti-studio. And it's important to him that you have directors who have creative control. And I see that he definitely supports directors that do. It's mostly studios that he's gone after. Which is probably why he doesn't, that, which is probably another reason why he doesn't like superhero films. Because those are the studios that take the most advantage of directors. Also, he doesn't pull. like superhero films because these interviewees keep asking about them. That that too. So I'm wondering, like, also if it's we're just hearing about this from him because that's just what's constantly being reported. 
but yeah, he is going out and doing the other things that you mentioned. It'll be reported, but it's like a comment that he made five years. I feel like they just need to bring it up for relevancy, I guess. They keep bringing it up the for, the, hits. for the drama. Yeah. They keep bringing yep, it up for exactly. the drama. All right. Well, I think we've covered as much as we're going to cover. I hope yeah. that anyone listening has at least gotten our general opinion about some of these things we have been able to talk about and maybe come away with a few things that you haven't watched that now you're going to go out and watch and hopefully you'll enjoy them based off of our recommendations or you'll hate watch them and hate them as much as we <laughs> did, depending on what it was. Um, you know, not going to judge whatever you're into. And I, and I will say this too, if, you know, if you're listening to this and you absolutely hate something that we love, I, I fucking dare you to come at us and, <laughs> and give us, you know, engagement i, I dare you <laughs> hate listening you to this episode of the podcast over and over again <laughs> you, you mad you mad because gwen stacy is a uh, canon trans, trans girl because because well, guild decree well all well yeah come <laughs> come and engage us i dare you <laughs> all right con- <laughs> film film detectives if people liked what you had to say and they want to find you else anywhere else on the internet where can they do that you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Op Silver Screen. On Facebook, we're at Operation Silver Screen, but Twitter and Instagram, it's Op Silver Screen. And our podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, and basically everywhere you can find a podcast. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you, listeners, for tuning into this episode of Caster Scaled. Email us at casterscaled at gmail.com. Uh, let us know what you want to hear for season five. Because season four is now officially over. We thought it was over a couple weeks ago, but it is now officially over. Come and join us on the Discord. That's where all the fun stuff is happening. And it's where you will be able to engage with us in between seasons. And uh, we will see you next season. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 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 See you later. Congrats on four seasons. (laughs) Thank you.